Chapter 37. Harden. Oh my god Lillian whispers loudly. I'm broken from my thoughts of my earlier fight with Tessa and look up to see what she's gaping at. Tessa. In a dress, that fucking dress, that I was imagining her in. And it makes her already big chest look fuck. I blink rapidly, trying to collect myself, before she reaches the table. For a moment I'm convinced that I'm hallucinating. It looks even sexier than I imagined. Every guy she passes turns to look at her. One even knocks over his drink. I grip the edge of the table waiting for the asshole to speak to her. If he does, I swear to fuck, that's Tessa? Oh my god. Lillian is practically panting. Stop staring at her, I warn, and she laughs. The man who knocked over his drink leans away from his wife as his eyes follow my girl. Chill, Lillian says, gently touching my hands. My scarred knuckles are now white from my tight grip on the table. Landon pulls Tessa close to him, and away from the married asshole. She smiles up at him, and he pulls her even closer as they walk. What the fuck was that? Tessa stands behind Landon as Lillian's parents and Karen and Ken go through the normal I'm so fucking classy, because I shake your hand, even though I saw you last night shit. Before I know it, Tessa's eyes find Lillian, and they widen and lower. She's jealous. Good. I was hoping she'd be. Chapter 38. Tessa. Panic courses through me at the sight of Hardin sitting next to this girl. He doesn't even acknowledge my presence as I take the seat next to Landon, on the other side of the table from him. Hello, and who might you be? Ken's friend asks with a smile. I can tell by his tone that he's one of those men that think they are better than everyone else in the room. Hi, I'm Tessa, I say, then smile curtly and nod. Landon's friend. My eyes dart to Harden, whose lips press into a thin line. Well, he's clearly entertaining the man's daughter, so why ruin their fun? It's great to meet you Tessa. I'm Max, and this is Denise. He gestures to the woman beside him. It's nice to meet you, Denise says. The two of you are an adorable couple. Harden starts coughing. Or choking. I don't want to look at him and see which, but I can't help it. When I do, his eyes are narrow, glaring at me. Landon laughs. Oh, we aren't together. He looks at Hardin, like he expects him to say something. Of course he doesn't. The girl looks slightly lost and a little uncomfortable. Good. Hardin leans into her and says something into her ear, and she smiles at him, before shaking her head. What the hell is happening? I'm Lillian. It's nice to meet you. She introduces herself with a friendly smile. Bitch. You too, I manage to say in return. My heart is hammering in my chest, and I can barely see straight. If we weren't at the table with Hardin's family and Ken's friends, I would throw a drink in Hardin's face, and with his eyes stinging, he wouldn't have a chance to stop me from slapping him this time. A menu is placed in front of each of us, and I wait as one of the empty glasses in front of me is filled with water. Ken and Max begin to talk about the oddness of having to choose between tap and bottled water. Do you know what you want? Landon asks quietly a few moments later. I know he's trying to distract me from Hardin and his new friend. I, I don't know, I whisper and look over the fancy handwritten menu. I can't imagine eating right now. My stomach won't stop turning, and I can't seem to control my breathing. Do you want to go? He says into my ear. I glance across the table at Hardin, whose eyes meet mine, before he turns back to Lillian. Yes. I want to get the hell out of here and tell Hardin to never speak to me again. No. I'm not going anywhere, I say and sit up higher, straightening my back against the chair. Good. Landon praises me as a handsome server arrives at our table. We'll have a bottle of your best white wine, Ken's friend tells him, and he nods. Just as he begins to walk away. Max calls after him. We weren't finished yet, he says. Max orders a list of appetizers. I've never heard of any of the dishes he's chosen, but I don't suspect I'll be eating much of them anyway. I try desperately not to look across the table at Hardin, but it's hard, so damn hard. Why would he come here with her? He's dressed up too. If he doesn't have jeans on under the table, I think what's left of my heart will shatter. It takes me an hour of begging, to get Hardin dressed in anything other than black jeans and a t-shirt, 
Yet here he is next to this girl in a white button down. I'll give you a few minutes to look over the menu, and if you have any questions about the dishes, my name is Robert, the server says. His eyes meet mine, and his mouth opens slightly, before he looks away quickly, only to look back at me. It's this dress and the damn cleavage. I offer a small awkward smile, and he returns it, red creeping up his neck and spreading to his cheeks. I expect him to look at Hardin, but then I remember that due to the way we're seated, it's Landon and I that look like a couple, and Hardin's with Lillian. My stomach flips again. Hey, man. Take your order, ergo, Hardin says, interrupting my thoughts. Eh sorry, Robert stammers and leaves the table in haste. All eyes move to Hardin, mostly showing disapproval of his behavior. Karen looks embarrassed. Ken too. Don't worry, he'll be back. It's his job, Max says with a shrug. He would think Hardin's behavior was acceptable. I scowl at Hardin, but he doesn't seem to care, he's too infatuated by those damn blue eyes. As I watch him with her, I feel like he's a stranger to me, as if I'm intruding on some private moment shared between a loving couple. The thought causes bile to rise in my throat. I swallow it down, and I'm thankful when the server, Robert, returns with a wine and ice buckets, this time bringing another server along, likely for moral support. Or protection. Hardin watches him the entire time, and I roll my eyes at his. Audacity, glaring at the poor guy when here he is, acting as if he doesn't know me at all. Nervously, Robert fills my glass to the brim, and I quietly thank him. He smiles less shyly this time and moves to fill Landon's. I've never seen Landon drink except at Ken and Karen's wedding, and even then he only had one glass of champagne. If I wasn't so distraught over Hardin's behavior, I turn down the wine and not drink in front of Ken and Karen, but I've had a long day, and without the wine I don't think I'd be able to make it through this dinner. Ken covers the top of his glass and says, no, thank you, when Robert comes his way. I look up at Hardin to make sure he isn't readying a snide remark about his father, but once again he's talking quietly to Lillian. I'm so confused right now, why is he doing this? Yes, we were fighting, but this is too much. Taking a big sip, I find that the wine is cool and crisp and deliciously sweet on my tongue. I'm tempted to just gulp it all down, but I have to pace myself. The last thing I need is to get drunk and emotional in front of everyone. Hardin doesn't decline the wine, but Lillian does. He rolls his eyes at her, teasing her, and I force my eyes away from them, before I turn into a puddle of tears on the beautifully stained hardwood floor. Max was scaling the wall, he was so drunk that he had to be pulled down by campus security. Ken says, and everyone at our table laughs. Everyone except Hardin, of course. I twirl my fork around my pasta and take another bite. I focus on how delicious the freshly made noodles are, and how they look wound around the tines of the fork. Otherwise I'd have to focus on Hardin. I think you have an admirer, Denise says to me. I look up, and follow her eyes to Robert, who is clearing the dishes from the table beside us, his eyes on me. Don't pay him too much attention. Just a waiter wanting what he can't have, Max states with a sly smile, surprising me with his callousness. Dad. Lillian glares at her father. But he just gives her a smile, before cutting into his steak. Sorry, sweetie, I'm only stating the truth a girl as beautiful as Tessa here shouldn't be looking at anyone working in hospitality. If only he'd stop there, but oblivious, or immune to, our discomfort, Max continues his degrading remarks until I finally drop my fork onto my plate with a clatter. Don't, Hardin says to me, speaking to me for the first time since I arrived. Shocked, I look at him, then back to Max, weighing my options. He's being a jerk, and I've had almost an entire glass of wine. I should probably keep my mouth shut, like Hardin said. You can't talk about people like that. Lillian looks at her father and he shrugs. Fine, fine, he grumbles, waving his knife a little and chewing on his steak. Far be it from me to upset anyone. Beside him, his wife looks embarrassed as she wipes the corners of her mouth with a cloth napkin. I'm going to need more wine, I tell Landon, and he smiles, sliding his half-empty glass over to me. I smile at the gesture. I'll wait for Robert to come back to the table. 
Thank you, though. I can feel Hardin's eyes on me as I search the restaurant. I don't see the server's blonde hair, so I reach over, grab the bottle myself, and fill my glass. I half expect Max to make a comment about my manners, but he refrains. Hardin is staring coolly across the room, and Lillian is talking to her mother. I'm in my own world, a hallucination in which Hardin is sitting next to me, his hand on my thigh, and he leans in to make some cheeky comment that makes me laugh and blush feverishly. My head is a little fuzzy as I clear all of the food off my plate and finish off my second glass of wine. Landon is in conversation with Max and Ken about sports, of course. I stare at the printed tablecloth, trying to find faces or pictures inside the black and white swirls. I find a cluster that resembles an H, and my finger traces the pattern repeatedly. Suddenly I stop and look up quickly, paranoid that he may have seen me tracing the letter. But Hardin isn't paying attention to me. His eyes are only for her. I need some air, I tell Landon and stand. My chair screeches against the wooden floor, and Hardin looks up from his conversation momentarily, but then he catches himself and pretends to have only been looking for his water before he returns to talking to this new girl of his. Chapter 39. Tessa. My heels clacking loudly on the hardwood, I concentrate on making it to the back door of the restaurant through my alcohol haze. If we were closer to home, I'd leave right now, pack my bags for Seattle, and stay in a hotel until I found an apartment. I am so sick of heart in doing this kind of shit to me, it's painful and embarrassing, and it's breaking me down. He's breaking me down, and he knows it. That's exactly why he's doing it. He said as much before, he does these things, because he knows they'll get to me. When I push through the door, briefly hoping it won't set off an alarm or something, the chill night air envelops me. It's calming, blanketing me in something other than the stale air, an awkward tension of dulled inner companions. I rest my elbows on a rock ledge and look out into the woods. It's dark, nearly pitch black out there. The restaurant is nestled right in the middle of a wooded area, creating a secluded atmosphere. It works and would be wonderful but it's not ideal for me right now, when I already feel trapped. Are you alright? A voice sounds from behind me. When I turn, Robert is standing in the doorway, a stack of plates in one hand. Um, yeah, I just needed to breathe, I say. Oh, it's a little cold out here. He smiles. His smile is polite, and actually very endearing. I give a smile back. Yeah, a little. Both of us stand in silence. It's slightly awkward, but I don't mind. Nothing is as awkward as sitting at that table. A few seconds later he speaks up. I haven't seen you around here before. He gently places the plates on an empty table and walks closer to me. He leans his elbows on the ledge only a few feet away. I'm visiting. I've never been here before. You should visit in the summer. February is the worst time to come. Well, except for November and December, maybe even January. His cheeks flush as he stammers, why you get what I mean. Then he lets out a little chuckle-like sound. Trying not to giggle at him, and his red cheeks, I say, I bet it's beautiful in the summer. Yeah, you are. His eyes widen. I mean it is. It is beautiful, he corrects himself, and runs his hand over his face. I force my lips together in an attempt not to laugh at him, but I can't help it. A small giggle escapes, causing him to look even more horrified than before. Do you live here? I ask, trying to sidestep his embarrassment. His company is refreshing. It's nice to be around someone who's not so intimidating. Hardin owns every room he's in, and his presence is overwhelming half the time. That calms him a tiny bit. Yeah, born and raised. And you? I go to WCU. I'll be starting at the Seattle campus next week. I feel like I've been waiting so long to say those words. Wow, Seattle. Impressive. He smiles and I laugh again. Sorry, wine makes me laugh a lot, I blurt, and he looks over at me with a grin. Well, I'm glad it's not me that you're laughing at. His eyes roam my face, and I turn away. He looks back to the restaurant. You should get back inside before your boyfriend comes looking for you. I turn around to look in through the windows into the elegant space. 
Hardin's head is still turned toward Lillian. Trust me, no one is coming to look for me, I say with a sigh. And my bottom lip quivers as my heart betrays me, sinking lower and lower. He looks pretty lost without you, Robert tries to reassure me. I spy Landon looking around the room, with nobody to talk to. Oh. That's not my boyfriend. Mine is the one across the table, the one with the tattoos. I watch as Robert looks at Hardin and Lillian and confusion sweeps over his soft features. Swirls of black ink peek out from the top of Hardin's collared dress shirt. I love the way white looks on him. I love being able to see the hint of ink under the light-colored fabric. Um, does he know he's your boyfriend? Robert asks, raising his eyebrow. I tear my eyes away from Hardin as he smirks, a deep smirk, the kind of smirk that shows his dimples, the kind of smirk that is usually given only to me. I'm beginning to wonder the same thing. I bring my hands to my face and shake my head. It's complicated, I groan. Hold yourself together, don't fall into his game. Not this time. Robert shrugs. Well, who better to talk about your problems with than a stranger? We both gaze at the table that I'm missing from. No one except Landon seems to even notice. Don't you have to work? I ask, hoping that he doesn't. Robert is young, older than me, but he can't be any older than 23 at the most. He seems fully confident as he smiles and says, yeah, but I have it in good with the owner, seeming to be telling himself a joke that I'm not included in. Oh. So, if that's your boyfriend, who's the girl with him? Her name is Lillian. I can hear the venom in my own voice. I don't know her, neither does he well, he didn't, but apparently now he does. Robert's eyes meet mine. So he brought her here to make you jealous? I don't know. It's not working. Well, I am jealous, I mean, look at her. She's wearing the same dress as I am, and she looks way better in it. No, no, she doesn't, he says quietly, and I smile, thanking him. We were getting along fine until yesterday. Well, fine for us. And then we got in a fight this morning, but we always fight. I mean, we fight all the time, so I don't know what it is about this fight that's so different, but it is. It's different. It doesn't feel like the rest of our fights, and now he's ignoring me the way he used to when we first met. I realize that I've been speaking more to myself than to this stranger with curious blue eyes. I sound insane, I know I do. It's the wine. The corners of his lips turn into a smile, and he shakes his head. No, not insane at all. Robert smiles, which brings a little laugh out of me. With a nod at my table, he says, he's looking at you. My head snaps up to look. Sure enough, Hardin's eyes are on me, and my new shrink, eyes that burn into me, and make me literally flinch at their intensity. You should probably go inside, I warn him. I'm expecting Hardin to get up from the table at any time, to rush out here and throw Robert over the deck and into the woods. He doesn't, though. He remains still, his fingers wrapped around the stem of a winnaglass as he looks at me one last time, before lifting his free hand and resting it across the back of Lillian's chair. Oh God. My chest tightens at his callous action. I'm sorry, Robert says. I'd almost forgotten he was next to me. It's fine, really. I should be used to it. I've been playing these games with him for six months now. I cringe at the truth, cursing myself for not learning my lesson after one month, or two, or three, yet here I am outside with a stranger watching as Hardin shamelessly flirts with another girl. I don't know why I'm telling you all of this. I'm sorry. Hey, I'm the one who asked, he kindly reminds me. And we've got plenty more wine, if you want some. His smile is kind and playful. I certainly will need more. I nod and turn away from the window. Do you get this a lot? Half-drunk girls whining about their boyfriends? He chuckles. No, actually, it's usually rich old men complaining that their steak isn't medium rare. Like the guy at my table, the one in the red tie. I gesture to Max. God, he's a jerk. Robert nods in agreement. Yeah, he is. No offense. But anyone who sends a salad back because it has too many olives is a jerk by definition. We both laugh, and I cover my mouth with the back of my hand, then worry that the laughter will bring some of my tears out. Right? 
He's so serious too, like he gave us this massive speech on his well-considered reasoning about olives after that. I deepen my voice to try to mimic the annoying girl's annoying father. Too many olives overpowers the delicate, yet earthy taste of the arugula. Robert bursts out laughing, doubling over. Hands on his knees, he looks up and asks in a voice much closer to Max's than mine was, could I have four? Three just will not do, and five is far too many, it simply does not balance the flavor palette. I lose myself in laughter to the point that my stomach is aching. I don't know how long it lasts, but I hear a door open suddenly, and Robert and I both instinctively stop and look up to see Hardin standing in the doorway. I stand up straight, smoothing my dress. I can't help but feel like I was doing something wrong, even though I know that I wasn't. Am I interrupting something? Hardin barks, commanding all attention. Yes, I respond, my voice coming out as clear as I was hoping. My breath is still staccato from laughing so hard, my head is swimming from the wine, and my heart is aching over Hardin. Hardin looks to Robert. Apparently. Robert's face still holds a smile, his eyes alight with humor as Hardin tries his best to intimidate him. But he doesn't falter, he doesn't even blink. Even he has had enough of Hardin's shit, and he's trained to always be nice. But here, out of earshot of the rest of the diners, he doesn't seem to have a problem showing his amusement at Hardin's absurd attitude. What do you want? I ask Hardin. When he turns to me, his mouth is pressed in a hard line. Get inside, he demands, but I shake my head. Tessa, don't play these games with me. Let's go. He reaches for my arm, but I yank it away and stand my ground. I said no. You go back inside, I'm sure your friend misses you, I hiss. You Hardin looks back to Robert. You should really be the one to go inside. Our drinks are in need of refilling, he says, then snaps his fingers in the most insulting way possible. I'm off, actually. But I'm sure you can charm someone else into taking care of your drinks, Robert says with a shrug. Hardin stands falters momentarily. He's not used to anyone talking back to him, especially not strangers. Okay, let me rephrase this, he steps toward Robert. Get the fuck away from her. Get inside and find something fucking else to do, before I grab you by that fucking ridiculous collar and bash your head against that ledge. Hardin. I reproach him, stepping between the two of them. But Robert seems unfazed. Go ahead, he says slowly, confidently. But you should know that this is a very small town. My dad's the sheriff, grandpa's the judge, and uncle's the one they locked up for assault and battery. So if you want to take your chances bashing my head in, he shrugs, go for it. My mouth is wide open, and I can't seem to close it. Hardin's glare is murderous, and he seems to be weighing his options as he looks back and forth between Robert, me, and the inside of the restaurant. Let's go, he says again to me at last. I'm not going, I tell him, backing away. But I do turn to Robert and say, can you give us a minute please? He nods slowly, giving Hardin one last glare before walking back inside. So what, you're going to fuck the waiter now. Hardin grimaces, and I step back even farther, willing myself not to break under his stare. Would you just stop, already? We both know how this will go. You'll keep insulting me. I'll walk away. You'll come after me and tell me you won't be rude anymore. We'll go back to the cabin and sleep together. I roll my eyes, and he looks absolutely lost. In his usual hardened way, he collects himself rapidly. Throwing his head back in laughter, he simply says, wrong and steps back toward the door. I won't be doing that. It seems you've forgotten how it really goes, you throw a fit over something I say, you walk away, and I only come after you, so I can fuck you and you he adds with a sinister glare, you always let me. My mouth falls open in horror, and my hands move to my stomach to hold my body together after his splintering words. Why? I gasp, the cold air nowhere, to be found as I try to catch my breath. I don't know. Because you can't stay away. Probably because I fuck you better than anyone else ever would. His tone is clipped and cruel. Why now? I correct my earlier question. What I meant was, why are you doing this now? Is it because I won't go to England with you? Yes and no. 
I won't give up Seattle for you, so you turn on me? My eyes are burning, but I will not cry. You show up with her, I gesture toward Lillian at the table, and say all these hateful things to me? I thought we were past this. What happened to you not being able to live without me? What happened to you trying your best to treat me the way you should? He looks away from me, and for a moment, a barely recognizable moment, I see a deeper emotion behind his hateful glare. There is a big difference between not being able to live without someone and loving them, he says. And like that, he walks away, whatever was left of my respect for him following in his wake. Chapter 40. Harden. I wanted to hurt her, to make her feel like shit, the way that I felt when I looked up from the table to see her laughing. She was fucking laughing when she should have been sitting across from me vying for my attention. It was like she didn't give a fuck about me getting close to Lillian. She was too focused on the fucking waiter, and whatever the hell he was saying. So my mind began sifting through hateful thoughts, trying to pick one, that was sure to break her down. Lillian's statement from this morning popped in, and it warmed my anger, so I said it, before I could stop myself. There is a big difference between not being able to live without someone and loving them. I almost want to take them back almost. She deserves them, she really does. She shouldn't have said that she didn't want me to go to Seattle with her. She said I turned on her, I didn't turn on her. I'm here for her, on her side. She's the one trying to leave me every damn chance she gets. I'm leaving, I announce when I reach the table. Six sets of eyes look up, and Landon rolls his, before looking over to the door. She's outside, I tell him sarcastically. He can go out there, and put on fucking kid gloves for her, I'm sure as hell not going to. What did you do now, he has the nerve, to ask me in front of everyone. I glare at him. Mind your own fucking business. Harden, my father warns. Not him too, everyone is fucking against me, apparently. If my father wants to start shit with me, I fucking dare him. I'll go too, Lillian says, standing. No, I snap, but she ignores me, and follows me as I make my way through the restaurant, and out the front door. What the heck happened, she asks when we get outside. Without breaking my stride, I shout over my shoulder, she was out there with that fucking guy, that's what happened. Then what? What did she say when you told her, that I'm not a threat? She stumbles slightly in her high heels, but I don't stop to help her as I try to decide where the hell I'm actually going. I knew I should have fucking driven my own car here, but no, Tessa had to get her way. Big surprise there. I didn't tell her. Why not? Do you know what she's probably thinking right now? I don't give a shit what she thinks. I hope she's thinking that I'm going to fuck you. She stops walking. Why? If you love her, why would you want her to think that? Oh, lovely, now Lillian is turning on me too. I turn to face her. Because she needs to learn that, she holds up one hand. Stop. Just stop there, because she doesn't need to learn anything. It seems to me that you're the one who needs to be learning something. What did you say to the poor girl? I said what you said to me this morning about there being a difference between not being able to live without someone and loving them, I tell her. She shakes her head in confusion. You said that to her, as in you can't live without her, but don't love her? Yes, did I not just tell you that? Tessa number two needs to just go away, because she's getting on my last fucking nerve just like Tessa the original. Wow, she says, and laughs. She's laughing at me too. What? What's so funny? I nearly yell. You are so clueless, she mocks me. When I said that to you this morning, I wasn't referring to you, I was talking about her. I meant that just because you think she can't live without you doesn't mean that she's in love with you. What? Do you assume that you have her so wrapped around your finger that she won't leave you because she can't live without you, when in reality it seems like you have her trapped and that's why she won't leave you, not because she loves you but because you've made her feel that she can't be without you. No, she loves me. I know she does, and that's why she'll be following me out here any moment now. Lillian throws her arms wide. Does she? Why would she, when you do things to hurt her on purpose? I've had enough of this shit. You're in no position to be giving anyone a goddamn lecture. I throw my hands in the air as wildly as she just did. 
your girlfriend is probably fucking someone else right now, while you're here trying to play couples therapist between Tessa and me, I growl. Lillian's eyes widen, and she takes a step back from me the way Tessa did only minutes ago. Her blue eyes begin to water, shining in the darkness. She shakes her head and starts to walk back toward the restaurant parking lot. Where are you going? I call to her through the wind. Back inside. Tessa may be stupid enough to put up with your crap, but I'm not. For a moment I almost follow this girl who I thought was my friend. I don't know, but I felt like I could trust her despite only knowing her for two days. Fuck that, I'm not following anyone. Tessa or Tessa number two. They can both go to hell, I don't need either of them. Chapter 41. Tessa. My chest is aching, my throat is dry, and my head is spinning. Hardin basically just told me that he doesn't love me and that he chases me just so he can sleep with me. The worst thing about the things he said to me is that I know he didn't mean them. I know he loves me, he does. In his own way, he loves me more than anything. He's shown me that time and time again in the last six months. But he's also shown me that he'll stop at nothing to hurt me, to make me feel weak, just because his ego is bruised. If he loved me the way he should, he wouldn't purposely hurt me. He couldn't have meant that he only wants sex from me. He doesn't really see me as a toy, does he? With him, truth and lies slide back and forth as easily as his moods. He couldn't have meant it. But he said it with such conviction. He didn't even blink. I honestly don't know anymore. Through all of the fights, tears, holes in our walls, I have always held on to the small certainty that he loves me. Without that, we have nothing. And without him, I have nothing. The irrational and flaring tempers we both have, mixed with our young ages, are becoming too much to handle. There's a difference between not being able to live without someone and loving them, the word slice through me again. The air in this place is too stale, too thick and consuming, and the laughter of the customers is growing sinister. I look for an exit. Glass doors leading to a balcony are closed. I open them and welcome the cool air. I sit there, staring out into the darkness, enjoying the quiet of the night in my own slowing mind. I don't notice the door to the deck opening until Robert is next to me. Brought you something, he says and holds up the bottle of wine, waggling it playfully. He dips his shoulder to one side, and a grin spreads across his handsome face. I surprise myself by smiling, a real smile, despite the fact that on the inside I'm screaming, huddled in a corner crying. Pity wine? I question, holding my hands out for the white-labeled bottle. I recognize it as the same wine Max ordered earlier. It must have cost a fortune. He grins, placing the wine in my hands. What other type of wine is there? The bottle is cold, but my hands are nearly numb from the February air. Glasses. He smiles, dipping his hands into the deep pockets of his apron. I couldn't fit actual winoglasses, so I grabbed these. He hands me a small styrofoam cup, and I hold it up while he uncorks the bottle. Thank you. The wine fills the cup, and I bring it to my lips the moment he pulls away. We can go inside, you know? There are a few sections that are closed down already, so we can sit there, Robert says, then takes a sip. I don't know. I sigh, shifting my gaze to the table. He left, he says, the sympathy obvious in his voice. So did she, he adds. Do you want to talk about it? No, not really. I shrug. Tell me about this wine. I grasp for a neutral, non-depressing subject. This guy? Okay, well, it's, um, old and aged to perfection? He laughs and I join him. I'm good at drinking it, though, not so much studying it. Okay, not the wine, then, I say. Tipping my cup back, I finish the rest as quickly as possible. Um, he says, looking behind me. My stomach drops at his nervous expression, and I hope Hardin isn't back to spit more venom at me. When I turn around, Lillian is standing in the doorway, seemingly unsure whether to come out or not. What do you want? I ask her. I'm trying to control my jealousy, but the wine coursing through me doesn't work in favor of manners. Robert grabs my empty cup just as the wind knocks it over and begins to refill it. I get the feeling he's trying to keep himself busy to avoid 
whatever dramatic or awkward situation lies ahead. Can I talk to you? Lillian asks. What is there for us to talk about? Everything is pretty clear to me. I take a big gulp from my cup, letting the cold wine fill my mouth. Unexpectedly, she doesn't respond to my attitude. She just walks over to us and says flatly, I'm gay. What? If Robert's clear blue eyes hadn't been focused on me, I'd have spit the wine back into my cup. I look from him to her and swallow slowly. It's true. I have a girlfriend. Hardin and I are only friends. She frowns. If you would even call us that. I know that look. He must have just told her off. Then why I start? Is she being honest? But you guys, were all over each other. No, he was being a little touchy-feely, I guess you'd say, like when he put his arm around my chair. But he was only doing it to make you jealous. Why would he do that? On purpose? I ask. But I know the answer, to hurt me, of course. I told him to tell you. I'm sorry if you thought something was going on between us. It's not. I'm in a relationship, with a girl. I roll my eyes and hold my cup out to Robert for more wine. You seem pretty comfortable going along with it, I remark harshly. With honest, pleading eyes, she says, that wasn't my intention. I wasn't really paying attention to what he was doing. I'm really sorry, if you were hurt in all this. I'm fumbling for reasons, to tell this girl off, but I can't come up with any. Lillian being gay is a huge relief to me, and I wish that I'd known sooner, but it really doesn't change much with Hardin. If anything, it makes his behavior worse, because he was purposely trying to make me jealous, and then up the ante, by saying the most hateful things he could think of to me. Watching him flirt with her didn't hurt nearly as bad as hearing him tell me that he didn't love me. Robert fills my glass, and I take a small sip while watching Lillian. So what changed your mind, and made you tell me? He went off on you, didn't he? She half smiles, then sits down at the table with us. Yeah, he did. He's good at that, I say and she nods. I can tell she's slightly nervous, and I keep reminding myself that she isn't the problem here, Hardin is. Do you have any more cups? I ask Robert, and he nods, giving me a proud smile. My stomach flutters lightly, from the wine, I'm sure. Not in my pocket, but I can grab another from inside, he offers politely. We should go inside, anyway, your lips are turning blue. I look up at him, and my gaze goes to his lips. They're full and pink, they look so soft. Why am I staring at his lips? This is what wine does to me. I want to be staring at Hardin's lips, but he only uses them to yell at me lately, it seems. Is he inside? I ask Lillian, and she shakes her head. Okay, let's go in, then. I have to save Landon from that table, anyway, especially from that Max guy, I say without thinking, then quickly look at Lillian. Shit, sorry, she surprises me by laughing. It's fine, trust me. I know my dad's an asshole. I don't respond. She may not be a threat to my relationship with Hardin, but that doesn't mean that I like her, even if she does seem kind of sweet. Are we going inside or Robert rocks on the heels of his black dress shoes? Yeah. I gulp down the rest of my wine and head inside. I'll get Landon. Are you sure you can drink here? In your uniform? I ask my new friend. I don't want him to get in trouble. My head is fuzzy, and the thought of him getting arrested by his father makes me giggle. What, he asks, his eyes searching my face. Nothing, I lie. Heading inside, Lillian and I walk over to our party's table. I put my hands on the back of Landon's chair, and he turns to look up at me. Do you okay, he asks quietly, while Lillian speaks to her parents. I shrug. Yeah, sort of. I wouldn't be if I wasn't borderline drunk from downing several cups of wine. Do you want to hang out with us? We're going to hang out here and have some wine some more wine. I smile. Who? Her too? Landon glances across the table at Lillian. Yeah, she's well, she's okay. I don't want to blurt out the girl's personal business in front of everyone. I told Ken that I'd watch the game with him at Max's cabin, but if you want me to stay here, I will. No I do want him to stay, but I don't want him to alter his plans for me. It's okay. 
I just thought you might want to get away from them, I whisper, and he smiles. I do, but Ken's excited for me to come, because Max likes the opposing team. I think he thinks it'll be funny to watch us give each other crap or something. Then he leans in closer so only I can hear him. Are you sure about hanging out with that guy? He seems nice, but Hardin will probably try to murder him. I think he can hold his own, I assure him. Have fun watching the game. I lean down and press my lips against Landon's cheek. I jerk away quickly and cover my mouth. I'm sorry. I have no idea why it's okay. Landon laughs. I look around the table and I'm relieved to see that everyone seems to be an engaged in conversation. Thankfully my embarrassing show of affection went unnoticed. Be careful, okay, Tessa? And call me, if you need me. I will. And if you get bored, come back here. Will do. He smiles. I know he won't get bored watching the game with Ken. He loves spending time with the only father figure in his life, something that Hardin doesn't share the same enthusiasm for. Dad, I'm an adult, I hear Lillian huff from across the table. Max shakes his head once with authority. There is absolutely no need for you to be out running the streets here, you'll go back to the cabin with us. That's final. It's obvious that he's one of those men who love to have complete control over everyone in his life. The nasty smirk on his hard face confirms it. Fine, his frustrated daughter responds. She looks to her mother, but the woman stays silent. If I had another glass of wine, I would call the jerk out, but I don't want to upset Ken and Karen. Tessa, are you coming back with us? Karen asks. No, I'm going to stay here for a little while, if that's okay? I hope she doesn't mind. I watch as she looks to Lillian, and then behind me to where Robert stands in the distance. I get the feeling she has no clue about Lillian's sexual orientation, and she's annoyed by the way Hardin was behaving with her. I love Karen. That's fine with us, you have fun. She smiles approvingly. Okay. I return her smile and walk away from the table without saying goodbye to Max and his wife. We're good to go. She's not allowed to stay, I tell Robert when I reach him. Not allowed? Her father is a jerk. I'm sort of glad, though, because I'm not sure how I feel about her. She reminds me of someone. I can't quite put my finger on who I let the thought trail off as I follow Robert to an empty section of the restaurant. A few tables sit in the closed-off area, bare save for unlit votive candles and salt and pepper shakers. As we sit, Zed's mutilated face flashes through my mind. I ask Robert, are you sure you're okay with hanging out with me? Hardin may come back, and he has a tendency to assault people Robert pulls a chair out from me and laughs. I'm sure, he answers. Taking the seat across from me, he refills our styrofoam cups with white wine, and we toast, the cup's soft material bending slightly, and lacking that clink of glassware. Nice and cozy, unlike the rest of this hard-edged restaurant. Chapter 42. Hardin. I've called every damn taxi company between here and college trying to get a ride back home. No one accepted, of course, because of the distance. I could take a bus, but public transportation really isn't my thing. I remember the way I used to cringe when staff would mention Tessa taking the bus to the mall or to Target. Even when I disliked Tessa well, when I thought I did I'd still panic at the thought of her sitting alone on the bus with a bunch of fucking creeps. Everything has changed since then, since those days when I'd tease and taunt Tessa just to get a rise out of her. Her face when I left her on the balcony of the restaurant maybe it hasn't changed at all. I haven't changed. I'm torturing the girl I love. That's exactly what I'm doing, and I can't seem to stop. This isn't all my fault, though, it's her fault too. She keeps pushing me to go to Seattle, and I've made it clear that I'm not giving in on that. Instead of battling me, she should just pack her shit and come to England with me. I'm not staying here whether I'm expelled or not I'm bored in America, and it's been nothing but shit for me. I'm sick of seeing my dad all the time, I'm sick of everything here. Watch where you're going, Dick a female voice says in the darkness, startling me. I sidestep the figure before I run into her. Do you watch where you're going I fire back, without stopping. Why the hell is this chick out here in front of Max's cabin, anyway? 
excuse me? She says, and I turn around to look at her, just as the motion sensor light clicks on from the cabin's porch. I get a good look at her. Brown skin, curly hair, ripped jeans, biker boots. Let me guess, Riley, right? I roll my eyes at the girl in front of me. She puts a hand on her hip. And who the hell are you? Yep, Riley. If you're looking for Lillian, she isn't here. Where is she? And how do you know that I'm looking for her? The feisty girl challenges. Because I just fucked her. She tenses up, lowering her head, so darkness overtakes her features. What did you just say, she says and steps forward. I tilt my head to the side and stare at her. Christ, I'm just fucking with you. She's at the restaurant down the road with her parents. Riley raises her head and stops. Okay, and how do you know her? Met her yesterday. Her dad went to college with mine, I guess. Does she know you're here? No, I've been trying to get hold of her, she says in gestures at the woods surrounding us. But since she's out in the middle of fucking nowhere, she hasn't been answering. Probably her shit's a curve a dad keeping her from talking. I sigh. Yeah, he is that. Is he even going to let you see her? She scowls at me. Aren't you nosy as hell? But then she smirks proudly. Yeah, he will. He's a dick, but he's even more of a pussy, and he's afraid of me. Headlights flash out in the darkness, and I step onto the grass. That's them, I tell her. Shortly, the car pulls into the driveway and comes to a halt. Lillian practically jumps out the door and into Riley's arms. How did you get here, she practically squeals. I drove, her girlfriend answers dryly. How did you find me? I haven't had service all week. She nuzzles into her girlfriend's neck, and I watch as Riley's tough girl exterior begins to crack. Her hand moves up and down against Lillian's back lovingly. It's a small place, baby. It wasn't too hard. She pulls back a little to look at Lillian's face. Is your dad going to give me shit for coming? No. Well, maybe. But you know he won't make you leave. I force out a cough, feeling awkward standing there watching this reunion. Okay, well, I'm going to go, I say and begin to walk off. Bye, Riley says. Lillian doesn't say anything. After a few minutes, I reach the gate to my father's cabin and walk up the driveway. Tessa will be here any minute, and I want to be inside before the SUV pulls into the driveway. She'll be crying, I'm sure, and I'll have to come up with an apology to make her stop and listen to me. I barely make it to the porch, when Karen and Lillian's mother step out of the car. Where is everyone else? I ask her, my eyes searching for Tess. Oh, well, your dad and Landon rode back with Max to watch. Some game on television. Where's Tessa? Panic rises in my chest. She's back at the restaurant. What? What the fuck? This isn't how it's supposed to go. She's with him, isn't she? I ask the two women, even though I already know the answer. She's with the blonde asshole with the sheriff for a father. Yeah, she is, Karen says, and if I wasn't stuck out in the middle of nowhere with her, I'd cuss her out for the small smile she's trying to hide. Chapter 43. Tessa. So that's basically the story of my life, Robert ends with a grin. His smile is warm and honest, almost childlike, but in the most endearing way. That was interesting. I reach for the wine bottle on the table and lift it to fill my glass. Nothing comes out. Liar, he teases, and I burst into wine-induced giggles. His life story was short and sweet. Not plain really, not exciting, just normal. He grew up with both parents, his mother the schoolteacher, his father the sheriff. After graduating from the small college two towns away, he decided to go to medical school. He's only working here now, because he's on the wait list to get into the medical program at the University of Washington. Well, that and he makes pretty good money working at the most expensive restaurant around. You should have gone to WCU instead, I tell him, and he shakes his head. He stands up from the table and puts his index finger in the air to pause our conversation. I sit back in the chair while I wait for him to return. I rest my head against the wooden chair and look up. The ceiling in the small section is painted with clouds, castles, and cherubs. The figure directly above me is sleeping, 
with pink staining her cheeks and blonde curly hair topping her head. Her small white wings lay almost flat in slumber. Next to her, a boy, at least I assume it's a boy, stares at her, watching her with his black wings spread behind him. Harden. No way, Robert says suddenly, interrupting my thoughts. Even if I wanted to, they don't offer the program I need. Plus, the medical program is part of the main campus in Seattle. At WCU, your Seattle campus is much smaller. When I lift my head up, I see he has a new bottle of wine in his hands. Have you been there? To the campus? I ask him, eager to learn more about my new location. I'm even more eager to stop staring at creepy images of baby angels on the ceiling. Yeah, only once. It's small, but it's nice. I'm supposed to be there on Monday, and I have nowhere to live. I laugh. I know my poor planning shouldn't be funny, but right now it feels that way. This Monday? As in today, is Thursday and Monday is right around the corner? Yep. I nod. What about the dorms, he asks as he uncorks the bottle. Living in the dorms never crossed my mind, not even once. I had assumed well, hoped that Hardin would be accompanying me, so they weren't on my radar. I don't want to live on campus, especially now that I know how it feels to live on my own. He nods and starts pouring. True, once you get a taste of freedom, you can't go back. So true. If Hardin went to Seattle I stop myself. Never mind. So were you guys planning on trying the long distance thing? No, it would never work, I say, feeling an ache rise in my chest. The short distance thing barely even works for us. I need to change the subject, before I end up a blubbering mess. Blubbering, what a strange word. Blubbering, I say while pinching my lips between my thumb and index finger. Entertaining yourself? Robert smiles and places a full cup of wine before me. I nod, still laughing. I have to say, this is the most fun I've had at work in a while. Me too, I agree. Well, if I work here. I'm making no sense at all. I don't drink often, well, more now than I ever did before, but not enough to have built a tolerance, so I get drunk pretty fast, I sing, lifting my cup in front of my face. I'm the same. I'm not much of a drinker, but when a beautiful girl is having a bad night, I make an exception, he says bravely, but then flushes terribly. I just meant ah he covers his face with his hands. I don't seem to have a filter around you. I reach across the table and lower his hands from his face. He flinches slightly, and when he looks up at me his blue eyes are so clear. It's like I can tell what you're thinking, I say aloud, without a thought. Maybe you can, he whispers in response, and his tongue darts out to wet his lips. I know he wants to kiss me. I can read it on his face. I can see it in his honest eyes. Hardin's eyes are so guarded all the time I have to struggle to be able to read him, and even then I've never been able to read him the way I want to, the way I need to. I lean closer to Robert, the small table still between us as he leans forward too. If I didn't love him so much, I kiss you, I quietly say, not pulling back, but not moving any closer. As drunk as I am, and as angry as I am at Hardin, I can't do it. I can't kiss this other guy. I want to, but I can't. The left corner of his mouth lifts into a crooked smile. And if I didn't know how much you love him, I'd let you. Okay I'm not sure what else to say, and I'm drunk and awkward, and I don't know how to act around anyone other than Hardin and said, but in a way those two are similar. Robert isn't like anyone I've ever met. Except Landon. Landon is sweet and kind, and my mind is racing from the almost kiss with someone who is not Hardin. I'm sorry. I sit back down on the chair, and he does the same. Don't be. I'd much rather you not kiss me than kiss me and regret it. You're strange, I tell him. I wish I'd chosen a different word, but it's too late now. In a good way, I correct myself. So are you. He chuckles. When I first saw you in that dress, I thought you were going to be some snobby rich girl with no personality at all. Well, sorry. I'm surely not rich. I laugh. Or snobby, he adds. My personality isn't too bad. I shrug. It will do, he teases with a smile. You're awfully nice. Why wouldn't I be? I don't know. I start poking at my cup. 
Sorry, I know I sound like an idiot. He looks puzzled for a moment, then says, you don't sound like an idiot. And you don't have to keep apologizing. What do you mean? I ask. I'm vaguely aware that I have now picked apart the rim of the styrofoam cup. Small pieces of white litter the table in front of me. Do you keep apologizing for everything you say? You've said sorry at least 10 times in the last hour. You haven't done anything wrong, so you don't have anything to apologize for. I'm embarrassed by his words, but his eyes are so kind, and his voice doesn't hold even a sliver of annoyance or judgment. I'm sorry I say again reflexively. See? I don't know why I do that. I smooth a loose lock of hair behind my ear. I can guess, but I won't. Just know that you shouldn't have to, he states simply. I take a deep breath and let it out. It's relaxing to have a conversation with someone without worrying about upsetting them the entire time. Anyway, tell me more about your new job in Seattle, he says, and I'm thankful for the subject change. Chapter 44. Pardon. Where do you think I'm going? I yell up the walk at Karen, tossing my hands in the air out of frustration. She walks partway back down the porch steps, then says, I don't mean to butt in, Harden but don't you think you should leave her be for once? I really don't want to upset you, but I don't think anything good will come out of you going down there and causing a scene. I know you want to see her, but you don't know anything, I snap, and my father's wife pulls her head back a little. I'm sorry, Hardin, but I think you need to leave her be for tonight, she says, like she's my mother. Oh, why? So she can fucking cheat on me? Frustrated fingers tug at the roots of my hair. Tessa's already had one glass, one and a half glasses, to be exact, at dinner, and Lord knows she can't handle alcohol. If that's what you think of her Karen begins but stops herself. Never mind, go on, then, like always. She looks at Max's wife once, then adjusts her knee-length dress. Just be careful, dear, she says with a forced smile, and goes up the stairs with her friend. That headache gone. I continue on with my original plan and march toward the restaurant. I'll drag Tessa out of there, not literally, of course, but she will come with me. This whole thing is bullshit, and it's all, because I forgot to put on a fucking condom. That's what started this whole spiraling mess we're in. I could have called Sandra earlier and corrected the apartment shit, or I could have found Tessa another place to live, but that wouldn't work either. Seattle can't happen. It's taking longer to convince Tessa than I imagined it would, and now it's all even more complicated. I'm still shocked that she didn't get out of the car with Karen and whatever Lillian's mum's name is. I was positive that she'd be upset and ready to talk to me. It's that waiter, what kind of influence did he manage to have on her that would make her stay at the restaurant instead of coming with me? What did she see in him? Needing to collect my thoughts for a minute, I stop and sit down on one of the large rocks decorating the edge of the yard. Maybe barging in there isn't the best idea. Maybe I should get Landon to go inside and get her. She listens to him much more than she does me. But then I curse at my stupid idea because I know he won't go for it and, taking his mum's side, he'll make me look weak and tell me to leave her alone. I can't, though. Sitting on this cold ass rock for 20 minutes has made it worse, not better. All I can think about is the way she stepped back away from me on the deck and how she was so carefree laughing with him. What will I say to her? He seems like the kind of asshole who will try to stop me from making her leave. I won't have to hit him. If I yell enough, she'll come with me to avoid a fight. I hope. She hasn't done what I predicted so far tonight. This is all so juvenile, my behavior, my manipulation of her feelings. I know it, I just don't know what to do about it. I love her, fuck, do I love that girl. But I'm running out of ways to keep her close to me. In reality it seems like you have her trapped, and that's why she won't leave you, not because she loves you, but because you've made her feel that she can't be without you. Lillian's words play like a broken record through my mind as I get up and head past the end of the driveway. It's cold as fuck outside now, and the stupid shirt is too thin. Tessa didn't bring a jacket to dinner with her, and that dress, that dress, is skimpy and she'll definitely be cold. I should probably grab her a jacket what, if he offers her his jacket? Jealousy courses through me, and I ball my fists at the thought. 
You have her trapped, and that's why she won't leave you, not because she loves you fucking Tessa number two and her bullshit psychotherapy. She doesn't even know what she's talking about. Tessa does love me. I see it in her blue-gray eyes every time she looks at me. I feel it on her fingertips as she traces over the ink stained into my skin. I feel it when her lips touch mine. I know the difference between love and being trapped, between love and being addicted. I swallow the slight panic that threatens to overtake me again. She loves me. She does. Tessa loves me. If she didn't, I wouldn't know how to handle it. I couldn't. I need her to love me and be there for me. I've never let anyone get as close to me as she is. She's the only person that I know will always love me unconditionally. Even my mom gets sick of my shit sometimes, but Tessa always forgives me, and no matter what I do she's always there for me when I need her. That stubborn, obnoxious, uncompromising girl is my entire world. What are you doing, creep? I hear from the darkness. You have got to be fucking kidding me, I groan and turn to find Riley walking down the driveway of Max's cabin. I need to be paying more attention. I didn't even notice her coming toward me. You're the one out here stalking the damn driveway, she fires back. Where's Lillian? Not your concern. Where's Tessa? She says with a smirk. Lillian must have told her about our fight. Lovely. Not your concern. Why are you out here? Why are you? Riley clearly has an attitude problem. Do you have to be such a bitch? She nods exaggeratedly a few times. Yeah. I do, actually. I figured she'd chew my head off for calling her a bitch, but she doesn't seem to mind. I'm sure she knows she is. And I'm out here, because Lillian just fell asleep. And between her dad, your dad, and your dorky ass brother, I'm ready to puke. So what? You thought you'd walk around in the dark in the middle of February. I'm wearing a coat. She tugs at the bottom of her garment to prove her point. I'm going to find that bar I passed while I was driving up here. Why don't you drive, then? Because I want to drink. And do I look like someone who wants to spend their weekend in jail? She scoffs, walking past me. She looks back without stopping. Where are you going? To get Tessa. She's hanging out with Nevermind. I'm sick of telling people my fucking business. Now Riley does stop. You're an asshole for not telling her that Lil is gay. Of course she told you, I say. She tells me everything. That was a major dick move. It's a long story. You won't move to Seattle with Tessa, and now, she flips her hair over her shoulder, she's probably giving that blonde dude a blowjob in the bathroom of, I step toward her, anger boiling in my veins. Shut the fuck up. Now. Don't you fucking dare say shit like that to me. I have to remember that even though she has a mouth like mine, she is a female, and I would never take it there. Unfazed by my outburst, she replies calmly, don't like that much, do you? Maybe you do best to remember that next time you make some snarky ass comment about fucking my girlfriend. My breathing falters, deep and out of control. I can't stop thinking about Tessa's full lips touching him. I tug at my hair again, and turn in a circle. It's driving you crazy, isn't it? Her being with him? Do you really need to stop taunting me, I warn her, and she shrugs. I know it is. Look, I probably shouldn't have said that, but you were a dick first, remember? When I don't respond, she continues. Let's call a truce here. I'll buy you a drink, and you can cry over Tessa, while I brag about how good Lillian is with her tongue. She walks over to me and tugs at my sleeve, trying to drag me across the street. I can see the cheesy multicolored lantern lights on top of the tin roof of the small bar from here. I jerk my arm away from her. I need to get Tessa. One drink, and then I'll come with you as backup. Riley's words mimic my thoughts from a few minutes ago. Why? Why do you want to hang out with me? I make eye contact with her, and she shrugs again. I don't, really. But I'm bored, and you're out here. Besides, Lil seems to care about you for some reason that I don't get. She runs her eyes up and down my body. I really don't get it, but she likes you, as a friend, Riley says, with as much emphasis on the word friend as possible. So yeah, I would like to impress her by pretending that I give a shit about your doomed relationship. Doomed? 
I begin to follow her down the road. Out of all the shit that I just said, you chose that to comment on? She shakes her head. You're worse than me. She laughs and I stay quiet. The obnoxious girl grabs hold of my shirt again and leads me down the road. I'm too busy thinking to push her off. How can she think we are doomed when she doesn't even know me, know us? We aren't doomed. I know we aren't. I'm damned, but she's not. She will save me. She always does. Chapter 45. Tessa. Yikes, it dropped at least 10 degrees out here, Robert says to me as we step out the door. The cold air smacks me, and I wrap my arms around myself trying to stay warm. He looks over at me with a little frown. I wish I had a jacket to offer you, I also wish I could offer to drive you back, but I've been drinking. With a playfully horrified look, he adds, guess I'm not very gentlemanly tonight. It's okay, really, I say with a smile. I'm pretty drunk, so I'm warm, that makes no sense. I giggle and follow him down the sidewalk in front of the restaurant. Although, I should have worn different shoes. We could trade, he jokes. I gently push against his shoulder, and he smiles for what has to be the hundredth time tonight. Your shoes look more comfortable than Hardin's. His boots are so heavy, and he always leaves them by the door, so I never mind. Embarrassed by what I just started talking about, I shake my head to stop myself. I'm more of a sneaker guy, Robert says, letting me know it's okay. Me too. Well, not a guy. Again I laugh. My head is swimming from the wine, and my mouth seems to let out every single thought that crosses my mind, nonsensical and all. Do you know which way the cabins are? He reaches over to steady me as I almost walk into a parking block. Which cabins? This whole town is full of them. Um, well, there's a street with a small sign, and then like three or four more cabins, then another street. I try to remember the drive to the restaurant from Ken and Karen's place, but none of it makes sense. That doesn't give me much to go on, he chuckles, but we can walk until we find it. Okay, but if we don't find it within 20 minutes, I'm going to a hotel. I groan, dreading the walk in the discussion Hardin and I are sure to have when I arrive. And by discussion, I mean full on, knock down, drag out verbal brawl. Especially when he finds out that I've been drinking with Robert. Suddenly I turn to look at him as we walk through the dark. Do you ever get sick of people telling you what to do all the time? No one really does, but if they did, I would. You're lucky. I feel like someone's always telling me what to do, where to go, who to talk to, where to live. I let out a breath and watch it turn to steam in the cold air. It's getting on my nerves. I'm sure it is. I look up at the stars for a moment. I want to do something about it, but I just don't know what that is. Maybe Seattle will help you. Maybe I want to do something now, though, like run away or cuss someone out. Cuss someone out? He laughs and halts to bend down to lace his shoe. I stop walking a few feet ahead of him and look around at my surroundings. Now that my mind is racing with all the possibilities of potential reckless behaviors, I can't stop it. Yeah, cuss out someone in particular. You probably should take it slow. I know cussing someone out is pretty wild and all, but maybe start with something a little lighter, he says. It takes me a moment to comprehend that he's teasing me, but once I do, I see the humor in it. I mean it, though. Right now I just feel like doing something crazy. I pull my top lip between my teeth, pondering the idea. It's the wine, it's pretty strong, and you drank a load in a short amount of time. We both laugh again, and I can't seem to stop. The only things that bring me back to normalcy are the canteen-style lanterns hanging from a small building nearby. That's our bar, Robert informs me with a nod toward it. It's so small. I exclaim. Well, it doesn't have to be huge when it's the only one in the town. It's a load of fun. The bartenders dance on the bar and everything. Like Coyote Ugly? His smile brightens. Yes, only these women are all over 40 and have a bit more clothing on. His smile is infectious, and I know what we're doing next. Chapter 46. Hardin. No, I told you one drink. I meant one drink. I roll my eyes and push the ice around the empty glass with my finger. Whatever. 
She waves down the bartender and orders two more drinks. I said I didn't know one said it's for you she says with a condescending look. Sometimes a girl needs a backup. Well, you have fun. I'm going to get Tessa now. I get up from the bar stool, but she grabs hold of my shirt. Again. Stop touching me. Dude, stop being a dick. I said I would come, just let me finish these drinks. Do you even know what you're going to say to her, or are you planning to go all caveman style? No. I sit back down. I really haven't thought about what it is I'm going to say. I don't need to say anything except let's fucking go. What would you say? I dare to ask. Well, first of all, she pauses to give the bartender two fives and pulls the glasses near her, Lillian wouldn't be down at some restaurant with another girl or guy, without me. She takes a big drink out of one glass and looks at me. I would've burned that shit to the ground already. I really don't like her tone much. Yet you tell me to come and have a drink before I go? She shrugs. I didn't say my way was right. I'm just saying. This is bullshit. You are bullshit. I'm going. As I take a couple steps toward the door, the headache-inducing country music playing in the small bar gradually gets louder and louder, and I know what's coming. I shouldn't have even come to this shitty bar in the first place. I should have gone straight to find Tessa instead. The patrons inside all start cheering, and I turn to see two of the middle-aged bartenders climb onto the bar top. This is so damn awkward. Entertaining, but still fucking weird. You're going to miss the show. Riley cackles. I'm about to say something, but I hear a sound behind me, and once again, I sense what's coming. As I turn, my mouth dries, and my blood begins to boil instantly. Because as I do, Tessa stumbles in through the door of the little roadhouse. With him. Rather than rushing him like I'd like to do, I step back to the bar, and say to the back of Riley's head, she's here, with him. That's her. Riley takes her eyes off the old woman on the bar and turns. Her jaw drops. Holy shit, she's hot. I glare at her. Stop. Don't look at her like that. Lillian said she was pretty, but, fuck, look at her big T, don't finish that sentence. I stare at Tessa. She's fucking hot, I know this, but more importantly she's drunk, and she's laughing as she navigates through the high top tables. She chooses an empty one close to the bathroom and takes a seat. I'm going over there, I tell Riley. I don't have a fucking clue why I'm telling her anything, but part of me sort of wants to know what she'd do if she were in my shoes. I know Tessa is upset with me for a whole list of shit, and I don't exactly want to add anything else to it. She doesn't have any right to be mad at me, anyway, she's the one hanging out with a random ass guy from dinner, and now she comes stumbling in here drunk and laughing. With him. Why don't you just wait you know, watch her for a little bit, Riley suggests. What a fucking stupid idea, why would I watch her hang all over that douch bag? She's mine, and Riley looks up at me with curious eyes. Does she throw a fit, when you call her yours? No. She likes it, I think. At least she once told me she did, yours, Harden, yours. She moaned into my neck as I shifted my hips, burying myself deeper inside of her. Lil gets so pissed off when I say that. She thinks I'm claiming her as property or something, Riley says next to me, but all I can focus on is Tessa. The way she gathers her long hair in one hand and moves it to one shoulder. My anger is rising, my annoyance is growing, and my focus is blurring. How does she not know that I'm here? I can always tell when she enters a room. It's like the air changes and my body can literally feel hers coming near. She's too busy paying attention to him. He's probably telling her the proper way to pour water into a damn glass. Still looking at my girl, I say, well, Tess is mine, so I don't care what she thinks about being claimed. Spoken like a true asshole, Riley says and looks over at Tessa. You have to compromise, though. If she's anything like Lillian, she'll get sick of it and you'll end up with an ultimatum. What? I tear my eyes away from Tessa for a moment, and it's torture. Lillian got sick of my shit and left me. She, she lifts her glass toward Tessa, will do the same thing, if you don't listen to what she wants sometimes. It's amazing how much cooler Lillian is than her girlfriend. 
Okay, you don't know anything about our relationship, so you don't know what you're talking about. I look back at Tessa, who is now sitting alone at the table fiddling with a stray lock of hair and moving her shoulders to the music. After a second, I locate her waiter friend at the end of the bar, and my nerves calm slightly because of the distance between them. Look, man, Riley says. I don't have to know the details. I've spent the last almost hour with you. I know that you're a dumbass, and she's a needy, when I open my mouth to cuss her out, she just continues, Lillian is too, so don't get all pissy over it. She's needy, and you know it. But you know what the best part about having a needy girlfriend is? She gives a wicked smile. Besides the frequent sex, of course get to the point. I roll my eyes and look back to Tessa. Her cheeks are red, and her eyes are white in amusement as she watches the women finishing up their dance on the bar. Any second she'll see me standing here. The best part is that they need us, just not in the way you expect them to need you, though. They need us to be there for them sometimes too. Lillian was always so caught up in trying to save me, or whatever the hell she was doing, that her needs weren't being met. I mean, I didn't even acknowledge her birthday. I didn't do shit for her. I thought I was, though, because I was around her, and sometimes telling her that I love her, but it wasn't enough. An unwelcome chill travels down my spine. I watch as Riley finishes the rest of her first drink. But she's with you now, right? Yeah, but only because I showed her that she can depend on me and that I'm not the same bitch I was when she met me. She looks over at Tessa, then back to me. You know that saying all. The stupid girls are always posting online? I think it's like, while you're making, if you don't fuck. I can't remember, but basically it says treat your girl well, or someone else will. I don't treat her bad. Not all the time, at least. She barks out a disbelieving little laugh. Dude, just own it. Look, I'm no saint. I still don't treat Lily in the way I should, but I own that shit. You are in some hardcore denial. If you're sitting here thinking you don't treat her like shit, if you didn't, she wouldn't be sitting over there with that douch, who happens to be the exact opposite of you, and pretty damn hot. I can't even argue with her. She's right, for the most part. I don't treat Tessa like shit all the time, only when she does something to get me going. Like right now. And earlier. She's looking, Riley tells me, and my blood runs cold. I turn my head slowly in Tessa's direction. Her eyes are focused on mine, blazing, and I swear I see a hint of red in them as she looks at Riley, and then back to me. She doesn't move, she doesn't even blink. Her stare turns from surprise to primal in an instant, and I'm taken aback by the murderous glare directed our way. She's so pissed. Riley laughs next to me, and it takes everything in me not to pour her back of drink over her head. Instead, I mumble, shut up, grab the drink, and walk toward Tessa. Her douchy waiter is still at the end of the bar by the time I reach her. Whoa, I never thought I'd find you here, in a bar, drinking with another girl. Surprise, surprise, she quips with a sarcastic smile. Why are you here? I ask, stepping closer to her. She leans away. Why are you? Tessa, I warn, and she rolls her eyes. Not tonight, Harden, not happening. She climbs off of the tall chair and pulls her dress down. Don't walk away from me. My words come out as a command, but I know they're really a plea. I reach for her arm, but she pulls away. Why not? That's what you always do to me. She glares at Riley again. We're both here with other people. I shake my head. Fuck, no. That's Lillian's girlfriend. Her shoulders instantly relax. Oh. She looks into my eyes and pulls her bottom lip between her teeth. We need to leave now. So go. You and I, I clarify. I'm not going anywhere except somewhere fun, more fun than this place, since you're here, and you're always stopping my fun. Do you like the fun police? She smiles at her own stupid joke and continues. That's exactly what you are. You're the fun police. I should really get you a badge made, and you can wear it all around, you know, to stop everyone's fun. She rambles and bursts into full-on giggles. Christ, she's fucking wasted. How much did you drink? I yell over the music. I thought it was going to die down, 
but apparently the elderly dancers have been goaded into an encore. She shrugs. I don't know. A few, and this one too. She takes the cup from my hand, before I can stop her, sets it on the table, and hoists herself back onto the chair. Don't drink that. You're obviously smashed. What's that sound? She puts her hand to her ear. Is that the siren of the fun police I hear? Wah, wah, wah. For a second she pouts like a child, then laughs. Go away if you're going to be a fun sucker. Tessa lifts the glass to her mouth and takes three large gulps. She's swallowed half the drink in seconds. You're going to get sick, I say. Blah, blah, blah she mocks, tilting her head back and forth with each word. She looks past me, and a small smirk plays on her lips. You know Robert, right? I look to my side to find the asshole is standing next to me with a drink in each hand. Nice to see you again Robert says, then half smiles. His eyes are bloodshot. He's drunk, too. Did he take advantage of her? Did he kiss her? I take a deep breath. His father is the sheriff. His father is the sheriff. His father is the sheriff. His father is the fucking sheriff of this shithole of a town. I look back at Tessa and say over my shoulder, go away. Tessa rolls her eyes. I forgot how balsy she becomes when she has liquor in her veins. Don't go, she says, challenging me, and he sits down at the table. Don't you have company to entertain, she taunts. No, I don't. Let's go home. I'm barely controlling my temper. If this were any other night, Robert's face would be imprinted on the table by now. That cabin isn't home, we're hours from home. She finishes off the drink she stole from me. Then she gives me a look that somehow manages to mix loathing, drunk flippancy, and indifference. Actually, as of Monday, I don't have a home anyway, thanks to you. Chapter 47. Tessa. Hardin's nostrils flare as he tries to control his temper. I glance over at Robert, who looks slightly uncomfortable, though not in the least bit intimidated by Hardin. If you're purposely trying to make me angry, it's working, Hardin says. I'm not, I just don't want to go. And right as the music cuts off, I practically yell, I want to drink, and be young and have fun. Everyone turns to me. I'm not sure what to do with all the attention, so I awkwardly wave my hand in the air. Someone gives a hoot of approval, and half the bar raises their glasses in salute, and then goes back to talking. The music resumes, and Robert laughs. Hardin glowers. You've obviously had enough to drink, he says, eyeing the now half-empty glass that Robert brought to me. News flash. Hardin, I'm an adult, I remark in a childish tone. Damn it, Tessa. Maybe I should go Robert stands. Obviously, Hardin replies at the same time that I say no. But then, looking around us, I let out a sigh. As much as I was enjoying my evening with Robert, I know that Hardin will stand here the entire time making rude remarks, threats, whatever he has to do to make him leave. It's better if he does go. I'm sorry. I'll go and you can stay, I tell Robert. He shakes his head with understanding. No, no, don't worry about it. I had a long day, anyway. He's so calm and is going about everything. It's really refreshing. I'll walk you out, I tell him. I'm not sure if I'll ever see him again, and he's been so kind to me tonight. No, you won't, Hardin chimes in, but I ignore him and follow Robert toward the door of the small bar. When I look back at the table, Hardin is leaning against it with his eyes closed. I hope he's taking deep breaths in and out, because I'm in no mood for his crap tonight. Once we get outside, I turn to Robert. I really am sorry. I didn't know he was here. I was just trying to have a fun night. Robert smiles and slouches a little to better meet my eyes. Remember when I said to stop to apologizing for everything? He reaches into his pocket and pulls out a small pad and pen. I'm not expecting anything, but if someday you're bored and alone in Seattle, give me a call. Or not. It's up to you, if you want to or not. He writes something down, then hands it to me. Okay. I don't want to make any promises that I can't keep, so I just smile and tuck the small paper into the top of my dress. Sorry. I squeak when I realize that I basically just fondled myself in front of him. 
Stop saying sorry. He laughs. And especially not for that. He looks at the entrance to the bar, then out at the dark, dark night. Well, I better go. It was nice to meet you. Maybe we'll see one another again? I nod and smile as he walks down the sidewalk. It's cold out here, Hardin's voice says behind me, scaring the shit out of me. I huff and walk past him back into the bar. The table that I was sitting at is now taken by a bald man and his supersized mug of beer. I grab my purse off the stool next to him, and he just gives me a dead-eyed look. Or rather, gives my breasts one. Hardin is behind me. Again. Let's just go please. I step over to the bar area. Can I just get two feet of space? I don't even want to be around you right now. You said some pretty hateful things to me, I remind him. You know I didn't mean them, he answers, defending himself, attempting to make eye contact with me. I'm not falling for it. That doesn't mean you can say them. I look over at the girl, Lillian's girlfriend, who's watching Hardin and me from the bar. I don't want to talk about it right now. I was having a nice night, and you aren't ruining it. Hardin steps in between us. So you don't want me here? His eyes flash with hurt, and something in their green depths makes me backtrack. I'm not saying that, but if you're going to tell me that you don't love me, or how you use me for sex again, then you need to go. Or I will. I'm trying my hardest to keep my bubbly, giggly attitude instead of sinking down and letting the pain and frustration take over. You were the one who started all this shit, when you came here with him, drunk, might I add he begins. I sigh. Here we go. Hardin is the king of double standards. His latest one is walking toward us now. Jesus, would you two shut up? We're in a public place. The beautiful girl that Hardin was sitting with interrupts us. Not now, Hardin snaps at her. Come on, Hardin's obsession. Let's take a seat at the bar, she says, ignoring him. Sitting at a table toward the back of the bar and having a drink brought to me is one thing. Sitting at the bar top and ordering my own is another. I'm not old enough, I inform her. Oh please. With that dress on, you'll get a drink. She stares at my chest, and I pull the front up slightly. If I get kicked out, it's your fault, I tell her, and she tips her head back in laughter. I'll bail you out of jail. She winks, and Hardin stiffens next to me. He watches her with warning in his eyes, and I can't help but laugh. He tried to make me jealous with Lillian all night, and now he's jealous of Lillian's girlfriend winking at me. All of this juvenile back and forth, he's jealous, I'm jealous, the old lady at the bar is jealous, everyone is jealous, it's annoying. Slightly entertaining, especially now, but still annoying. My name is Riley, by the way. She takes a seat at the end of the bar. I'm sure your rude-ass boyfriend isn't planning on introducing us. I glance back at Hardin, expecting him to cuss her out, but he only rolls his eyes, which is pretty restrained for him. He tries to sit at the stool between us, but I grab the back, then place my hand on his arm, to help myself get up onto it. I know I shouldn't be touching him, but I want to sit here and enjoy my last night of this mini-vacation turned disaster. Hardin has scared away my new friend, and Landon is probably already asleep by now. I don't have any other options except sitting alone in the room back at the cabin. This seems better. What can I get you, a copper-haired bartender in a jean jacket asks me. We'll have three shots of Jack. Chill them first, Riley answers for me. The woman scans my face for a few seconds, and my heart begins to race. Coming up, she says finally, and pulls three shot glasses from under the bar, and places them in front of us. I wasn't going to drink. I only had one before you came, Hardin leans over, and says into my ear. Drink what you want, I am, I say without looking at him. Still, I silently pray that he doesn't get too drunk. I never know how he lacked. I can see that, he says by way of scolding me. I look at him with scorn, but end up staring at his mouth. Instead. Sometimes I just sit and stare at the slow movements of his lips when he talks. It's one of my favorite things to do. Perhaps noticing I've softened somewhat, he asks, are you upset with me still? Yes, very. Then why are you acting like you aren't? His lips move even slower. 
I really need to find out the name of that wine. It was really good. I already told you, I want to have fun, I repeat. Are you mad at me? I always am, he replies. I laugh a little. Isn't that the truth? What did you say? Nothing. I smile innocently and watch him rub the back of his neck with his hand, pinching the top of his shoulders between his thumb and forefinger. A shot of brown liquor is placed in front of me seconds later, and Riley raises her shot glass to harden in me. Here's to dysfunctional, borderline psychotic relationships. She smirks and tilts her head back to take her shot. Harden follows her lead. I take a deep breath before welcoming the cool burn of whiskey down my throat. One more. Riley cheers, sliding another shot in front of me. I don't know if I can, Isler. I've never been this drunk, never never. The whiskey has officially taken over my mind, set up camp, and doesn't appear to be leaving anytime soon. Harden is up to five shots, I lost count of mine after three, and I'm pretty sure Riley should be heaving on the floor from alcohol poisoning by now. I feel like this whiskey tastes good, I remark, dipping my tongue into the chilled shot. Next to me, Harden laughs, and I lean into his shoulder and put my hand on his thigh. His eyes immediately follow my hand, and I quickly pull it away. I shouldn't be acting like nothing happened earlier, I know I shouldn't, but it's easier said than done. Especially when I can barely think straight, and Harden looks so good in his white button-down shirt. I'll deal with our problems tomorrow. See, all you needed was a little whiskey to loosen up. Riley slams her empty shot glass on the bar top, and I giggle. What, she barks. You and Harden are the same. I cover my mouth to conceal my obnoxious giggles. No we aren't, Hardin says, speaking at that slower pace he resorts to when he's intoxicated. So does Riley. Yes, you are. It's like a mirror. I laugh. Does Lillian know you're here? I swing my head to the side and ask her. Nope. She's asleep for now. She licks her lips. But I fully intend on waking her up when I return. The music starts to increase in volume again, and I watch the copper-haired woman climb onto the bar for probably the fourth time tonight. Again? Hardin scrunches his nose, and I laugh. I think it's funny. I think everything is funny right now. I think it's lame, and it interrupts me every 30 minutes, he gripes. You should go up there. Riley nudges me. Up where? The bar. You should dance on the bar. I shake my head and laugh and blush. No way. Come on, you've been whining about being young and having fun, or whatever the hell you were going on and on about. Now's your chance. Dance on the bar. I can't dance. It's true. I've only danced, excluding slow dancing, once, and that was at the nightclub in Seattle. No one will notice, they're all even more wasted than you. She raises a brow, challenging me. No fucking way, Hardin says. Through my drunken haze I remember one thing, I'm sure as hell done letting him tell me what I can and can't do. Without a word, I reach down and unfasten the horribly uncomfortable straps around my ankles and let my high heels drop to the floor. Hardin's eyes are white as I climb on top of the stool, then onto the bar. What are you doing? He stands and looks behind us as the few patrons left in the bar begin to cheer. Test the song gets louder and the woman who has been serving us drinks smiles wickedly at me and takes my hand. Do you know any line dances, honey? She yells I shake my head, suddenly unsure of myself. I'll teach you, she yells. What the hell was I thinking? I just wanted to prove a point to Hardin, and look where it got me, on top of a bar getting ready to attempt a dance of some kind. I'm not even sure what a line dance is, exactly. If I'd known I was going to be up here, I would have planned it out better and paid more attention to the women when they were dancing earlier. Chapter 48. Harden. Riley's looking up at Tessa standing in front of her on the bar. Damn, I didn't think she would actually do it, she calls. Neither did I, but then again, she seems determined to push my buttons tonight. Riley looks at me, her face aglow. She's quite the wild child. No, she's not, I quietly disagree. Tessa looks mortified, obviously second-guessing her impulsive decision. I'm going to help her down. I begin to lift my hand up, 
but Riley smacks it down. Let her do it, man. I look at Tessa again. The woman who made our drinks is speaking to her, but I can't make out what she's saying. This is absolute bullshit, her dancing on a bar in a short ass dress. If I was to lean onto the bar, I could see up her dress, as can anyone else at the bar. It occurs to me that Riley probably already is. I glance down the bar both ways, take note that neither of the greasy men at the opposite end are eyeing her. Yet. Tessa watches the woman next to her, her brows furrowed in concentration, completely the opposite of her sudden need to be wild. She follows the movements of the old gal, and kicks out one of her legs, then the other, followed by a swift movement of her hips. Sit down and enjoy the show, Riley says next to me, sliding over one of her backup drinks. I'm drunk, too drunk, but my mind is clear as I watch Tessa begin to move, really fucking move. Her hands go to her hips, and she finally smiles, no longer caring that she has the full attention of almost everyone in the bar. Her eyes meet mine, and she fumbles her dance moves momentarily, before collecting herself and directing her eyes to the back of the room. Hot, isn't it? Riley smiles next to me as she brings her glass to her lips. Yes, obviously, watching Tessa on the bar is hot as hell, but it's also infuriating and unexpected. The first thought that comes to mind is, fuck, this is hot. The second thought is that I shouldn't be so engrossed in it and should be irritated at her constant need to defy me. But I can't think straight because of that first thought and the fact that she's dancing right in front of me. The way her dress is riding up her thighs, the way she's holding her hair back in one hand and laughing while trying to keep up with the woman next to her, I love to see her this way, so carefree. I don't see her laugh like that very often. A thin layer of sweat is coated her body, making her glow under the spotlights. I shift uncomfortably and pull the ridiculous dress shirt I'm wearing down in the front a little. Uh-oh, Riley says. What? I snap out of my trance and follow her eyes down the bar. Two men at the end of the bar are gawking at Tessa, and by gawking I mean their fucking eyes are bulging worse than my fucking dick right now. I look back up at Tessa, and her dress is dangerously high on her thighs, each time she kicks her legs out in front of her, it goes a little higher. That's enough of this shit. Easy, killer, Riley says. The song will be over in, and then she raises her hand, and waves it as the music fades. Chapter 49. Tessa. Hardin's hand reaches for mine to aid me, and I'm surprised. By the way he was scowling, and pouting the entire time I was dancing, I thought he'd be yelling by now. Or worse, I was half expecting him to climb up and drag me off the bar, then start a brawl with all the customers. See, no one noticed that you're a shitty dancer. Riley laughs, and I sit down on the cool bar top. That was actually so much fun. I yell, and once again the music stops. I laugh and jump down from the bar, Hardin's arm wrapped protectively around me until I'm steady enough for him to retreat. You should get up there next time. I say into Hardin's ear, and he shakes his head. No, he says solemnly. Don't pout, it's not cute. I reach out and touch his lips. It is cute, though, the way his bottom lip sticks out. His eyes shine at the contact, and my pulse quickens. I already feel high from the adrenaline that came from dancing on the bar top, something I never in my life thought I would do. As much fun as it was, I know I'll never do it again. Hardin sits down on the bar stool, and I stay standing between him and Riley, next to my empty stool. You love it. He smiles, my fingers still pressed against his lips. Your lips? I say with a smirk. He shakes his head. He's playful yet very serious at the same time, and it's intoxicating, he's intoxicating, and I'm highly intoxicated. This should be interesting. No, pissing me off. You love to piss me off. His tone is dry. No. You just get pissed off too easily. You were dancing on a bar in front of a room full of people. His face is mere inches from mine, and his breath is a heady combination of mint and whiskey. Obviously that would get to me, Tessa. You lucky I didn't pull you down, put you over my shoulder, and carry you out of this place. Over your shoulder, not your knee. I tease and stare into his eyes, completely disarming him. 
WH what? He stutters. I laugh before turning to Riley. Don't let him fool you, he loved that shit, she whispers to me, and I nod. My stomach tightens at the thought of Hardin watching me, but my mind tries to overrule my dirty thoughts. I should be fuming, I should be ignoring him, or yelling at him over sabotaging Seattle for me, again, or for the hurtful words he said to me, but it's nearly impossible to be pissed off when I'm this drunk. I allow myself to pretend that none of that happened, at least for now, and imagine that Hardin and I are a normal couple out with our friend having a drink. No lies, no dramatic fights, only fun and table dancing. I still can't believe I actually did that. I say to both of them. Me either, Hardin grumbles. I won't be doing it again, that's for sure. I swipe my hand across my forehead. I'm sweaty and it's hot in this small bar, the air is thick, and I need to breathe. What's wrong, he asks. Nothing, it's hot. I fan myself with my hand, and he nods once. Let's go, then, before you pass out. No, I want to stay longer. I'm such having fun. I mean, such a fun time. You can't even form a coherent sentence. So? Maybe I don't want to. Either you loosen up, or you can go. Do he begins, but I cover his mouth with my palm. SHH for once just SHH. Let's have fun. I use my other hand to touch his thigh again, squeezing this time. Fine, he says into my hand. I uncover his mouth, but I keep my hand inches away, so I can cover it again, if I need to. No more dancing on the bar, he says, gently negotiating. Fine. No more pouting or scowling, I fire back. He smiles. Fine. Stop saying fine. I bite back a grin. He nods. Fine. You're annoying-ish. Annoying-ish? What would your literature professor say to that kind of grammar? Hardin's eyes are deep jade, alight with humor, splashed bloodshot from the liquor. You're funny sometimes. I lean into him. He hooks his arm around my waist and brings me between his legs. Sometimes? He kisses my hair and I relax in his grip. Yep, only sometimes. He chuckles and doesn't let me go. I don't think I want him to. I know I should, but I don't. He's drunk and playful, and the alcohol in my system makes me lose sight of all common sense as always. Look at the two of you getting along. Riley holds her hands up to us like we're on display. She's so annoying, Hardin huffs. Twins. I laugh, and he shakes his head at me. Last call. My new friend calls from behind the bar. In the last hour I have learned that her name is Kami, that she's nearly 50, and that she just had her first grandchild in December. She shoves some printed pictures in my face, like every grandmother does, and I praise them, telling her how beautiful the child is. Hardin barely glanced at the images. Instead he started mumbling something about trolls, and so I quickly pulled the picture away from him before Kami heard. I sway from side to side. One more and I'm so done. I don't know how you haven't passed out yet. Riley exclaims, with obvious admiration. I do. Hardin has been taking my drinks from me halfway through and finishing them himself. You've been drinking more than anyone, probably more than him, Isler, pointing to the man at the end of the bar who has literally passed out with his head on the top of the bar. I wish Lillian could have came with us, I say and Hardin crinkles his nose. I thought you hated her, he asks, and Riley snaps her head to me. I don't hate her, I correct him. I didn't like her when you were trying to make me jealous by hanging out with her. Riley tenses, looking at Hardin beside me. What? Shit. Don't back away now, darling, she presses. I'm trapped and drunk and have no idea what the hell to say. I don't want to make her mad, that's for sure. Nothing, Hardin says to her, and holds up a hand. I was being a dick, and didn't tell Tessa that she was gay. You already know that. Her shoulders relax. Oh, okay, then. Jeez, she's just like him. See, nothing happened, so chill out, Hardin says to her. I'm chill, trust me, she coos and moves her stool slightly closer to mine. Nothing wrong with a little jealousy, right? Riley looks at me with a glint in her drunken gaze. Have you ever kissed a girl, Tessa? 
my scalp prickles, and I gasp dramatically. What? Riley, what the? Hardin says, but she cuts him off. I'm only asking a question. Have you ever kissed a girl? No. Have you ever thought about it? Drunk or not, I feel the embarrassment creeping onto my cheeks. I, being with a girl is much better, honestly. They're soft. Her hand moves to my arm. They know exactly what you want where you want it. Hardin reaches up and swipes her hand from my skin. Enough, he growls, and I pull my arm away. Riley breaks into uncontrollable laughter. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I couldn't resist. He started it. She nods toward Hardin through her convulsions and then stops to look at him with a big smile. I warned you earlier not to fuck with me. I let out a breath, extremely relieved that she was only trying to get a rise out of Hardin. A giggle bursts from my mouth, and Hardin looks mortified, pissed off, and maybe slightly turned on. You're paying for the drinks, since you want to be an asshole, Hardin says, pushing the long piece of paper past me and in front of her. Riley rolls her eyes and reaches into her back pocket, pulling out a card and placing it on top of the receipt. Tommy quickly swipes it and goes to attend to the passed out man at the other end of the bar. As we get to the door, Riley announces, well, we close down the bar, Lil is going to be pissed. Hardin holds the door for me to walk out. He almost closes it in her face, but I reach out to stop it and give him a hard glare. He laughs and shrugs, as if he did nothing wrong, and I can't stop the smile on my face. He's a jerk, but he's my jerk. Isn't he? Nothing's for certain, but I sure as hell don't want to think about that while walking back to the cabin at two in the morning. Will she still be asleep? I ask Riley. I sure as hell hope so. I hope everyone in our cabin is asleep too. The last thing I want is for Ken or Karen to be awake as we stumble through the front door. What? Are you afraid she'll scold you or something? Hardin taunts her. No well, yes. I don't want to upset her. I'm already skating on thin ice. Why? I ask nosily. Doesn't matter, Hardin says, dismissing me and leaving Riley lost in thought. The remainder of the walk is spent in near silence. I count my steps and laugh occasionally when I recall my bar dancing experience. When we reach Max's cabin, Riley hesitates before departing. It was nice to meet you, she says. I can't help but laugh at the comical way she scrunches her face, as if the words taste sour coming out of her mouth. I smile. You too. It was fun. For a moment I think about hugging her, but that would be awkward, and I get the feeling Hardin wouldn't like it at all. Bye, Hardin simply states without stopping. When we're almost to the cabin, it hits me how tired I am, and how I'm so thankful to be close. My feet are aching, and the harsh fabric of this itchy, Uncomfortable dress has surely scratched my skin. My feet hurt, I whine. Come here, I'll carry you, Hardin offers. What? I giggle. He smiles uncertainly. Why are you looking at me like that? You just offered to carry me. And it's just unlike you, that's all. I shrug, and he steps closer, hooks his arm under my legs, and lifts me into his arms. I would do anything for you, Tessa. You shouldn't be surprised that I carry you up a damn driveway. I don't speak, I just laugh. Hard. Uncontrollable laughter racks my body. I cover my mouth to stop it, but it doesn't help one bit. Why are you laughing? His face is stone, serious and intimidating. I don't know that was just funny, I say. We reach the porch, and he shifts me slightly, so he can turn the knob on the door. Me telling you that I do anything for you is funny? You'll do anything for me, except go to Seattle, marry me, or have children with me. Even in my drunkenness, the irony is not lost on me. Don't start with me. We're too drunk to have this conversation right now. Ooh, I immaturely remark, knowing that he's right. Hardin shakes his head and walks up the stairs. I latch onto his neck, and he smiles down at me despite his curt behavior. Don't rob me, I whisper and he lets go of me just enough to slide me down his torso. I turn and wrap my legs around his waist, letting out a small yelp as I cling to his body. SHH, if I was going to drop you, 
He threatens, it would be from the top. I do my best to look appalled. A wicked grin spreads over his face, and I lean up and stick my tongue out at him, touching the end of his nose with it. I blame the whiskey. At the end of the hall, a light clicks on, and Hardin hurries to the room we're sharing. You woke him up, he says and places me on the bed. I lean down to remove my shoes, rubbing my sore ankles as I drop the monstrous shoes to the floor. Your fault, I say and walk past him, and open the dresser drawer to dig out something more comfortable to sleep in. This dress is killing me, I groan, reaching behind me to unzip it. It was much easier to zip it when I was sober. Here. Hardin moves behind me, and brushes my hand aside. What the hell? What? His fingers trace over my skin, raising goosebumps. Your skin is red, like the dress left these marks on you. He touches a spot under my shoulder blade, and pushes the fabric down my back until it hits the floor. It was really uncomfortable, I whine. I can see that. He circles me with hungry eyes. Nothing is supposed to be marking you, except me. I gulp. He's drunk, playful, and his dark eyes give away exactly what he's thinking. Come here. He steps toward me, closing the small gap between us. He's fully dressed, and I'm only in a bra and panties. I shake my head. No I know there's something I have to say to him, I just can't recall what it is. I can barely remember my name, when he's looking at me this way. Yes he counters, and I back away. I'm not having sex with you. He grabs me by the arm and pushes his free hand into my hair, gently tugging at it, so I'm forced to look up at him. His breath fans across my face, his lips only inches from mine. And why is that? He asks. Because my mind scrambles for answers as my subconscious begs for the rest of my clothes to be torn off. I'm upset with you. So? I'm upset with you, too. His lips graze over my skin, trailing along my jawline. My knees are weak, my mind is heavy and cloudy. I crinkle my brow and ask, why would you be? I didn't do anything. My stomach clenches when his hands move to my backside, squeezing and kneading slowly. Your little show on the bar was enough to send me to the fucking madhouse, not to mention the fact that you were parading around town with that fucking waiter. You disrespected me in front of everyone by staying with him. His tone is threatening but his lips are soft as they travel down to my neck. I want you so bad, I wanted you at that shitty bar. After watching you dance like that, I wanted to take you into the bathroom and fuck you against the wall. He presses himself against me, and I can feel how hard he is. As much as I want him, I can't allow him to blame everything on me. Do I close my eyes, relishing the feeling of his hands on me, his lips on me? You are the one I can't form a solid thought let alone make a sentence. Stop it. I grab his hands to stop him from groping me further. His eyes flash, and he drops his hands to his sides. You don't want me? Of course I do, I always do. I just I'm supposed to be mad. Be mad tomorrow he says with that evil grin of his. I always do that, I need to. SHH he covers my mouth with his lips and kisses me, hard. My lips part and he takes full advantage, tugging at my hair once more, dipping his tongue into my mouth, and pulling me as close to his body as possible. Touch me, he begs, reaching for my hands. I don't have to be told twice. I want to touch him, and he needs the reassurance. This is the way we deal with things, and as unhealthy as it is, it doesn't feel that way, when he's kissing me like this, and begging me to put my hands on him. I fumble for the buttons on his shirt and he groans impatiently, using both hands to tug at either side of it, popping off the buttons. I like that shirt, I say into his mouth, and he smiles, his lips against mine. I hated it. I push the fabric down past his shoulders, and let it fall to the floor. His tongue is slow in my mouth, and I'm melting in his arms at the rough yet incredibly sweet kiss. I feel the anger and frustration behind his lips, but he does his best to hide it. He's always hiding. I know you'll leave me soon, he says, moving his lips down to my neck again. What? I pull back a little, surprised by his words, and confused. My heart aches for him, the liquor making me even more sympathetic toward his feelings. I love him, I love him so much. But he makes me feel so weak, 
so vulnerable. The moment I allow myself to believe he's worried, sad, or upset in any way, it's like all my emotions shift, only focusing on him, and not myself, or how I feel. I love you so, he whispers, dragging his thumb slowly across my lips. His bare chest and torso look heavenly against his black jeans, and I know I'm at his complete mercy. Harden, what, let's talk later. I want to feel you. He guides me to the bed, and I try to ignore my mind screaming at me to stop him, not to give in to him. I can't, though. I'm not strong enough to stop myself when his calloused hands are running up my thighs, pushing them open slightly, when he's teasing me with an index finger running over my panties. Condom, I pant, and his bloodshot eyes meet mine. What if we don't use one? What if I come inside of you, you wouldn't be but he stops himself, and I'm glad. I don't think I'm prepared for whatever it was he was going to say. He lifts himself off of me, stands to his feet, and saunters over to the suitcase on the floor. I lie back, staring at the ceiling, trying to sift through my drunken thoughts. Do I really need Seattle? Is Seattle important enough to me to lose Harden? The pain that courses through me at the thought is nearly unbearable. Are you fucking kidding me, he says from across the room. When I sit up, he's staring down at a small piece of paper in his hand. What the fuck is this, he asks as his eyes meet mine. What? I look down at the floor. My dress lies in a pile on the dark hardwood with my shoes. At first I'm a little confused, but then I look down and see my bra lying on the floor. Shit. I hop up quickly and attempt to grab the paper from him. Don't play stupid with me, you got his fucking number? He gapes, holding the paper above his head, so I have no chance of taking it back. It wasn't like that, I was mad and he was, bullshit, he shouts. Here we go. I know that look. I still remember the first time I saw that look on his face. He was pushing over the cabinet at his father's house the first time I saw his face twisted in anger this way. Hardin go on, call him. Let him fuck you because I sure as hell don't want to. Don't overreact I beg. I'm too drunk to get into a screaming match with him. Overreact? I just found another guy's number in your dress he hisses through his teeth, jaw clenched in annoyance. You weren't innocent here either I remark as he paces back. And forth. If you're going to yell at me, save your breath. I'm done fighting with you every single day, I say with a sigh. He points at me angrily. Do you do this? You're the one that constantly enrages me. It's your fault that I'm like this, and you know it. No. No, it's not. I struggle to keep my voice down. You can't blame everything on me. We both make mistakes. No, you make mistakes. A shit ton of them, and I'm sick of it. He tugs at his hair. Do you think I want to be this way? Fuck no, I don't. Do you do this to me? I stay quiet. Go on, cry, he says, mocking me. I'm not going to cry. His eyes go wide. Well, surprise, surprise. He claps his hands in the most degrading way possible. I laugh. Which stops him. Why are you laughing? He stares at me for a beat. Answer me. I shake my head. You're fucked up. I mean colossally fucked up. And you're a selfish bitch. What else is new? He snaps, and my laughter comes to an abrupt halt. I rise from the bed without a word, without a tear, and grab a t-shirt and shorts from the drawer. I pull them on hastily as he watches me. Where do you think you're going? He asks. Leave me alone. No, come here. He reaches for me, and I desperately want to slap him, but I know he'll stop me. No, get off of me. I shake my arm from his grip. I'm done. I'm so done with this back and forth. I'm tired and exhausted, and I don't want to do it anymore. You don't love me, you want to possess me, and I won't let you. I look straight into his brilliant green eyes. Straight through them, and say, you're broken, hardened, and I can't fix you. His face falls at the realization of what he's done to me, and to himself, and he stands in front of me with all emotion pulled out of him. His shoulders sink and his eyes are no longer brilliant as he stares back at me, finally seeing a blank expression mirrored back at him. I have nothing left to say, he has nothing left to break inside of me or himself, 
and by the way the color has drained from his face, he's finally realized it. Chapter 50. Tessa. Landon opens the door, rubbing his eyes. He's half-dressed, wearing only plaid pants, no shirt or socks. Can I sleep in here? I ask him, and he nods drowsily, not asking any questions. I'm sorry for waking you up I whisper to him. It's okay he mumbles, and stumbles back to the bed. Here, you can have this one, the other is flat. He pushes a fluffy white pillow against my chest. I smile, hugging the pillow close and sitting on the edge of the bed. This is why I love you. Well, not the only reason, but one of them. Because I gave you the best pillow? His smile is even more adorable when laced with sleep. No, because you're always here for me, and you have soft pillows. My voice is so slow, when I'm drunk it's odd. Landon lies back on the bed and moves his body over, so that there's plenty of room for me on the other side. Is he going to come in here after you? He asks quietly. I don't think so. The moment of humor that came with Landon and his soft pillows has been replaced by the ache of Hardin and the words we exchanged moments ago. I lie down on my side and look over at Landon lying next to me. Remember when you said he isn't a lost cause? I whisper. Yeah. Do you really believe that? Yeah, I do. He pauses. Unless he did something else, no, well nothing new, really. I just I don't know if I can. Do it anymore. We keep moving backward, and we shouldn't be. Every single time I think we're making progress, he becomes that same Harden I met six months ago. He calls me a selfish bitch, or basically tells me he doesn't love me and I know he doesn't mean the words, but every syllable crushes me a little more than the last, and I think I'm starting to understand that this really is just the way he is. He can't help it, but he can't change it either. Landon watches me with thoughtful eyes before his mouth turns to a frown. He called you a bitch? Tonight? I nod, and he sighs heavily, running his hand over his face. I was saying hurtful things to him, too. I hiccup. The heavy combination of wine and whiskey is going to haunt me tomorrow, I know it. He shouldn't call you out of your name, he's a man, and you're a woman. It's never okay, Tessa. Please don't make excuses for him. I'm not I just, but that's exactly what I'm doing. I sigh. I think this is all about Seattle. He went from getting a tattoo for me, and telling me, that he can't live without me to telling me he only chases me, because I fuck him. Oh my gosh. I'm sorry Landon. I cover my face with my hands. I cannot believe I just said that in front of him. It's okay, you did just fish your underwear out of the hot tub, remember? He grins, lightening the conversation, and I hope that the relative darkness of the room at least hides my blushing. This trip has been a disaster. I shake my head, pressing it against the cool pillow. Maybe not. Maybe this is what you two needed. To break up? No, is that what happened? He lays another pillow next to me. I don't know. I bury my face further. Is that what you want? He asks delicately. No, but it's what I should want. It's not fair to either of us to keep doing this day in and day out. I'm not innocent here either I always expect too much from him. My mother's flaws have been passed down to me. She expects too much from everyone, too. Landon shifts a little. There isn't anything wrong with expecting things from him, especially when the things that you expect from him are reasonable he replies. He has to see what he has. Do the best thing that's ever happened to him, he needs to remember that. He said that it's my fault that he is the way he is. All I want is for him to be kind to me at least half the time, and I want security in our relationship, that's all. It's pathetic, really. I groan, my voice breaks, and I can still taste the whiskey laced with Hardin's mint on my tongue. Would you go to Seattle, if you were me? I can't help, but think I should just call it off and stay here, or go with him to England. If he's acting like this, because I'm going to Seattle, maybe I should, you can't not go. Landon interrupts. You've been gushing over Seattle since the day I met you. If Hardin won't go with you, then that's his loss. Besides, I give him a week of you being gone, before he shows up at your doorstep. You can't give in on this, he has to know that you're serious this time. You have to let him miss you. I smile while envisioning Hardin showing up a week after I leave, 
desperately begging for my forgiveness with lilies in his hand. I don't even have a doorstep for him to show up on. That was him, wasn't it? The reason that woman wasn't calling you back? Yeah. I knew it. Realtors don't just not return calls. You have to go. Ken will help you find somewhere to stay until you find a permanent place. What if he doesn't come after all? And worse, what if he does come, but he's even more angry because he hates it there? Tessa, I'm only saying this because I care about you, okay? He waits for my response, and I nod. You'd have to be insane to give up Seattle for someone who loves you more than anything but is only willing to show it half of the time. I think about Hardin saying that I make all the mistakes, that I make him act the way he does. Do you think he'd be better off without me? I ask Landon. He sits up a little and says, no, heck no. But seeing as I know you don't tell me even half of the messed up things he says to you, maybe it really isn't going to work. Reaching across the empty space between us, his hand touches my arm, and he rubs slowly. Using the alcohol in my veins as an excuse, I grant myself permission to ignore the fact that Landon, one of the only people who actually had faith in my relationship with Hardin, has just thrown in the towel. I'm going to feel like hell tomorrow, I say to change the subject, before I break the promise that I made with myself not to cry. Yeah, you are, he teases. Do you smell like a liquor cabinet? I met Lillian's girlfriend. She kept giving me shots. Oh, and I danced on a bar. He gasps gleefully. You didn't. I did. It was so embarrassing. It was Riley's idea. She's interesting. Landon smiles and seems to notice his fingertips still running over my skin. He pulls them away and tucks his arm under his head. She's the female version of Hardin. I laugh. She is. No wonder she sounds so annoying, he teases, and in a moment of drunken insanity, I glance over to the door, expecting to see Hardin there with a deep scowl, after hearing Landon's playful insult. You make me forget about everything. My mouth releases the words before my mind can catch up. I'm glad. My best friend smiles and grabs the blanket at the foot of the bed. He pulls it up over both of our bodies, and I close my eyes. Minutes pass in silence, and my mind is putting up a fight as sleep tries to pull me under. Landon's breathing slows, and I have to keep my eyes closed and pretend that it's Hardin breathing next to me, or my mind will never surrender. Hardin's angry scowl and harsh words flow through my hazy thoughts as I finally fall asleep, you're a selfish bitch. No. Hardin's voice startles me awake. It takes a moment to remember that I'm in Landon's room and Hardin is down the hall alone. Get off of her. His voice echoes down the hallway seconds later. I'm out of bed and at the door before he even finishes the sentence. He has to see what he has. He has to know that you're serious this time. You have to let him miss you. If I go rushing into that room, I know I'll forgive everything. I'll see him feeling vulnerable and afraid and I'll say whatever he needs to hear to comfort him. I pick my heart up off of the floor and walk back to the bed. I place the pillow over my head just as another no. Rips through the cabin. Tessa are you Landon whispers. No I reply, my voice cracking at the end. I bite down on the pillow and break my own promise. I begin to cry. Not for myself. The tears are for Hardin, for the boy who doesn't know how to treat the people that he cares about, the boy who has nightmares when I'm not in bed with him, but who tells me that he doesn't love me. The boy who really does need to be reminded how it feels to be alone. Chapter 51. Hardin. They won't stop, they won't stop touching her. His dirty, wrinkled hands run up her thighs, and she whimpers as the other man fists her ponytail in his hand, pulling her head back, hard. Get away from her. I try to shout at them, but they can't hear me. I try to move, but I'm frozen on the staircase from my childhood. Her gray eyes are wide afraid, and absolutely fucking lifeless as she looks at me, while a purple bruise already begins forming on her cheek. You don't love me, she whispers. Her eyes burn into mine as his hand creeps up and wraps around her neck. What? Yes, yes, I do. I do love you, Tess. I shout, but she doesn't listen. She shakes her head as he tightens his grip on her, and his friend reaches down between her legs. No, 
I scream one last time, before she begins to fade in front of my eyes. You don't love me her eyes are bloodshot from his assault, and I can't do a damn thing to help her. Tess. I flail my arm out across the bed to reach for her. The moment I touch her, this panic will go away, taking with it the fucked up images of those hands wrapped around her neck. She's not here. She didn't come back. I sit up and click on the lamp on the nightstand and scan the room. My heart is hammering against my ribcage, and my body is drenched in sweat. She's not here. A light knock at the door sounds, and I hold my breath as it creaks open. Please be hardened? Karen's soft voice fills the room. Fuck. I'm fine, I snap, and she opens the door further. If you need anything, please let me, I fucking said I'm fine. My hand swipes across the nightstand, knocking the lamp to the floor with a hideous crash. Without a word, Karen leaves the room, closing the door behind her, and I'm left alone in the darkness. Tessa's head lies on the counter, cushioned by her crossed arms. She's still in her pajamas, and her hair is in a nest on top of her head. I just need to take some Tylenol and drink some water, she groans. Landon sits next to her, spooning cereal into his mouth. I'll get you some. Once we get the car packed up, we can head out. Ken is still in bed, though. He had trouble sleeping last night, Karen says. Tessa looks up at her but stays silent. I know she's thinking, do they all hear me screaming like a pathetic little bitch? Karen walks over to open a drawer and grabs a couple of foil packets. I watch all three of them, waiting for someone to acknowledge me. No one does. I'm going to go pack. Thank you so much for the Tylenol. Tessa's voice is soft as she stands up from her seat at the counter. She takes the medication quickly, and when she sets the glass of water back onto the counter, her eyes meet mine, but she quickly looks away. It's only been one night without her, and already I miss her so much. I can't get the haunting images from my nightmare out of my mind, especially when she walks past me with no emotion at all. Nothing to let me know that I'll be okay. The dream felt so real, and she's being so cold. I stand still for a moment debating whether or not to follow her, but my feet decide for me as they scale the stairs. When I enter the room, she's kneeling down, unzipping the suitcase. I'm just going to pack everything, then we can go, she says without turning around. I nod, then realize that she can't see me. Yeah, okay, I mutter. I don't know what she's thinking, what she's feeling, or what I should say. I'm fucking clueless, as usual. I'm sorry, I say too damn loud. I know, she replies quickly. Her back is still turned to me as she begins to refold my clothes from the dresser and floor. I really am. I didn't mean what I said. I need her to look at me so I can be reassured that my dream was just that. I knew you didn't. Don't worry about it. She sighs, and I notice the way her shoulders are slumped lower than before. Are you sure I said some fucked up shit? You're broken, hardened, and I can't fix you that was the worst possible thing she could have said to me. She finally realizes how fucked up I am, and more importantly, she realizes that there's no cure for what's wrong with me. No one can fix me if it isn't her. So did I. It's fine. I have a really bad headache, can we talk? About something else? Of course. I kick at a piece of the lamp I broke last night. I have to owe my father and Karen at least five fucking lamps by now. I feel slightly guilty for snapping at Karen last night, but I don't want to bring it up to her first, and she's probably too polite and understanding to bring it up herself. Can you get your stuff from the bathroom please? Tessa asks. The remainder of my time at that damn cabin is spent this way, watching Tessa as she packs her things and cleans up the broken lamp without another word to me, without really looking at me. Chapter 52. Tessa. I'm so thrilled that we got to see Max and Denise again, it's been years. Karen gushes as Ken starts the SUV. The bags have been placed securely in the back, and I borrowed Landon's headphones to distract myself during the drive. It was nice. Lillian has grown so much. Ken appeases Karen with a smile. She has. She's such a beautiful girl. I can't help but roll my eyes. Lillian was nice and all, but after spending hours under the impression that she was interested in Hardin, I'm not sure if I'll ever care for the girl. 
I'm grateful that the chances of me seeing her again are slim to non-existent. Max hasn't changed over the years, Ken remarks, his voice low and disapproving. At least I'm not the only one who doesn't care for his arrogance and haughty attitude. Do you feel any better? Landon turns around to ask me. Not really. I sigh. He nods. You can sleep it off during the drive. Do you want a bottle of water? I can get it, Hardin interjects. Ignoring him, Landon grabs a thing of water from the small cooler on the floor in front of his seat. I thank him quietly and push the earbuds into my ears. My phone freezes repeatedly, so I turn it off and on again, hoping it will work. This drive will be miserable if I can't round out the tension with music. I don't know why I never did this before the Great Depression, when Landon had to show me how to download music. I smile slightly at the ridiculous nickname I've given those long days without Hardin. I don't know why I'm smiling, given that those were the worst few days of my life. I feel a similar sensation now. I know that time is coming again. What's wrong? Hardin leans down to speak into my ear, and on reflex I jerk away. He frowns and doesn't make a move to touch me again. Nothing, my phone is just its junk. I hold the device in the air. What are you trying to do, exactly? Listen to music and hopefully sleep, I whisper. He takes the phone from my hand and messes with the settings. If you listen to me and got a new phone, this wouldn't happen, he scolds. I bite my tongue and stare out the window while he attempts to fix my phone. I don't want a new one and I don't really have the money to get one right now, anyway. I have an apartment to find, new furniture to buy, bills to pay. The last thing on my mind is paying hundreds of dollars for something I already paid money for recently. It's working now, I think. If not, you can just use mine, he says. Use his? Hardin is voluntarily offering to allow me to use his phone? This is new. Thanks, I mutter and scroll through the song list on my phone before choosing. Soon music floods through my ears and enters my thoughts, drowning out my inner turmoil. Hardin leans his head against the window and closes his eyes, the dark rings beneath them emphasizing his lack of sleep. A wave of guilt hits me, but I push it back. Within minutes, the calming music coaxes me to sleep. Tessa. Hardin's voice wakes me. Are you hungry? No, I groan, not wanting to open my eyes. You're hungover, you should eat, he says. Suddenly I realize that I'm feeling the need for something to absorb all that stomach acid. Fine, I say, giving in. I don't have the energy to put up a fight today, anyway. Minutes later a sandwich and fries are placed on my lap and I open my eyes. I pick at the food and lay my head back on the seat after finishing half of it. But my phone has frozen yet again. Seeing me start to futz with it, Hardin pulls my earbuds out of my phone and plugs them into his. Here. Thanks. He's already opened the music app for me. A long list appears on the screen, and I scroll through to find anything familiar. I almost give up, but then my eyes move to a folder named T.I. look over at Hardin, whose eyes, surprisingly, are closed and not watching me. When I tap the folder, all of my favorite music appears, even songs that I've never mentioned to him. He must have seen them on my phone. Things like these make me question myself. The small, thoughtful gestures that he tries to conceal from me are my favorite things in the entire world. I wish he'd stop hiding them. With a gentle nudge, it's Karen who wakes me this time. Wake up, dear. I look over and see Hardin is asleep. His hand is on the seat between us, his fingers barely touching my leg. Even in his sleep, he gravitates to me. Hardin, wake up, I whisper and his eyes fly open, wide and immediately alert. He rubs them, then scratches his head and stares at me, gauging my expression. Are you okay? He asks quietly, and I nod. I'm trying to avoid any confrontation with him today, but I'm growing nervous at his calm demeanor. It's usually a precursor to a blow-up. We file out of the car, and Hardin walks to the back to retrieve our bags. Karen wraps her arms around me and hugs me tight. Tessa, Dear, thank you again for coming. It was a lovely time. Please come visit soon, but in the meanwhile, take Seattle by storm. When she pulls away, 
Her eyes are full of tears. I'll visit soon, I promise. I hug her again. She has always been so kind and supportive of me, almost like the mother I never had. Good luck, Tessa, and let me know if you need anything. I have a lot of connections in Seattle. Ken smiles and awkwardly wraps an arm around my shoulder. I'll see you again before I leave for New York. So no hugs for you yet, Landon says, and we both laugh. I'll be in the car, Hardin mumbles and walks off, not even saying goodbye to his family. Watching him go, Ken says to me, he'll come around, if he knows what's good for him. I look at Hardin, who is now sitting in the car. I sure hope so. Going back to England, isn't good for him. He has too many memories, too many enemies, too many mistakes there. Do what's good for him. You in Seattle, Ken assures me, and I nod. If only Hardin saw it that way. Thank you again. I smile at them, before joining Hardin in the car. He doesn't say a word when I get in. He only turns on the radio, and raises the volume up high, so I know he doesn't want to talk. I wish I knew what went on inside his mind at times like this, when he's so unreadable. My fingers fiddle with the bracelet he gave me for Christmas and I stare out the window as the drive continues. By the time we park at the apartment, the tension I feel between us has grown to an unbearable level. It's driving me insane, yet he doesn't seem to be affected at all. I move to get out, and Hardin's large hand reaches over to stop me. He brings his other hand to my chin and tips my head up, so I have to look at him. I'm sorry. Please don't be upset with me, he says quietly, his mouth inches from mine. Okay, I breathe, inhaling his minty scent. You're not okay, though, I can tell. You're holding back, and... I hate it. He's right. He always knows exactly what I'm thinking, but yet he's so clueless at the same time. It's a confusing contradiction. I don't want to fight with you anymore. So don't, he states, as if it's that simple. I'm trying not to, but so much happened during that trip. I'm still trying to process it all, I admit. It started with me finding out that Hardin sabotaged my apartment and ended with him calling me a selfish bitch. I know I ruined the trip. It wasn't only you. I shouldn't have spent time with, don't finish, he interrupts and drops his hand from my chin. I don't want to hear about it. Okay. I glance away from his intense stare, and he puts his hand over mine, squeezing gently. Sometimes I well. Sometimes I get fuck. He sighs and starts again. Sometimes when I think about us, I start to get paranoid, you know? Like I don't know why you're with me sometimes, so I act out and my mind starts making me believe that it won't work, or that I'm losing you, and that's when I say stupid shit. If you could just forget about Seattle, we could be happy finally, no more distractions. Seattle isn't a distraction, Hardin, I reply softly. It is. You're only pushing it, so much to prove a point. It's amazing how his tone can change from soothing to ice in a matter of seconds. I look out the window. Can we please stop talking about Seattle? Nothing is changing, you don't want to go, and I do. I'm sick of going around and around about it. He pulls his hand away, and I turn back to him. Fine, what do you suggest we do, then? Do you go to Seattle without me? How long do you think we would last? A week? A month? His eyes regard me coolly, and I shiver. We could make it work, if we really wanted to. At least long enough for me to try Seattle, and see if it's what I want. If I don't like it, we can go to England. No, 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 he says with a shrug. If you go to Seattle, we won't be together at all. That will be it. What? Why? I fumble the words and scramble for my next response. Because I don't do long distance. You also didn't do dating, remember? I remind him. It's infuriating that I'm basically begging him to stay in a relationship with me, when I should be considering leaving him for the way he treats me. Look how that's turning out, he says cynically. You were literally just apologizing for lashing out at me two minutes ago, and now you're threatening to end our relationship, if I go to Seattle without you? I gape while he nods slowly. So let me get this straight, you offered to marry me, if I don't go, but if I do go, you're breaking up with me? I wasn't prepared to bring up his offer, but I couldn't stop the words from coming. Marry you? 
His mouth falls open and his eyes narrow. I knew I shouldn't have mentioned it. What, you said that, if I chose you, you'd marry me. I know you were drunk, but I thought maybe, you thought what? That I would marry you? As he speaks these words, all of the air in the car disappears, and breathing proves harder and harder as the seconds pass in silence. I will not cry in front of this boy. No, I knew you wouldn't, I just, then why bring it up? You know how drunk I was, and desperate for you to stay I would have said anything. My heart sinks at his words, at the scorn in his voice. Like he's blaming me for believing the bullshit that comes out of his mouth. I knew insulting me would be his reaction, but a small part of me the part that still had faith in his love for me led me to believe that maybe he meant his proposal. This is deja vu. I once sat here, in this car seat, while he mocked me and laughed at me for thinking we would begin a relationship. The fact that I'm just as hurt now, actually a lot more hurt than I was then, makes me want to scream. I don't, though. I sit there, quiet and embarrassed, just like I always do when Hardin does what he always does. I love you. I love you more than anything, Tessa, and I don't want to hurt your feelings, okay? Well, you're doing an amazing job, I snap and bite down on the inside of my cheek. I'm going inside. He sighs and opens his car door at the same time as I open mine. Going around to the back, he opens the trunk. I'd offer to help him carry the bags, but I really don't feel like interacting with him, and he just insists on doing it himself anyway. Because more than anything, Hardin wants to be an island. We walk through the complex in silence, and the only noise in the elevator is the whir of the machinery pulling us upward. When we get to our place, Hardin puts his key in the lock, then asks me, did you forget to lock the door? At first I don't realize what he's asked, but then I recover and reply, no, you locked it. I remember. I watched him lock the door before we left. I remember how he rolled his eyes and made a joke about me taking too long to get ready. That's weird, he says, and steps inside. His eyes scan the room like he's searching for something. Do you think, I start. Someone was in here, he answers, becoming instantly alert as he presses his mouth into a hard line. I begin to panic. Are you sure? It doesn't look like anything is missing. I walk toward the hallway, but he quickly pulls me back. Don't go in there until I look around, he commands. I want to tell him to stay put, that I will check, but it's silly, really, the idea of me protecting him, when in reality he'd be the one protecting me. I nod, and a chill creeps down my spine. What if someone really is inside? Who would come into our apartment when we aren't here, and not steal the giant flat screen television I can still see hanging on the wall in the living room? Hardin disappears into our bedroom, and I hold my breath until I hear his voice again. It's clear. He reappears from the bedroom, and I let out a deep breath. Are you sure someone was here? Yes, but I don't know why they didn't take anything me either. My eyes scan the room, and I notice the difference. The small stack of books on the nightstand next to Hardin's side of the bed has been moved. I especially remember the highlighted book I gave him being on top, because it made me smile knowing that he was reading it over again. It was your fucking dad. He suddenly shouts. What? If I'm honest, the thought was already planted in my mind, but I didn't want to be the one say it. It had to be him. Who else would know we were gone and come into our home but not steal shit? Only him, that stupid, drunk motherfucker. Harden. Call him, right now, he demands. I reach for my phone in my back pocket but then freeze. He doesn't have a phone. Hardin throws his hands up like it's the worst thing he's ever heard. Oh yeah, of course not. He's fucking broke and homeless. Stop it, I say with a glare. Just because you think it may have been him doesn't mean you can say things like that in front of me. Fine. He lowers his arms and makes a sweeping gesture to escort me out. Let's go find him, then. I walk over to our landline. No. We should just call the police and report it, not go on a manhunt for my father. Call the police and say what? That your drug addict father broke into our apartment but didn't steal anything? I stop in my tracks and turn to face him. I can practically feel my temper flaring through my eyes. Drug addict? He blinks rapidly and takes a step toward me. I meant Runky doesn't look at me. He's lying. 
Tell me why you said drug addict I demand. He shakes his head, running his hands over his hair. He looks at me, then down at the floor. It's just an assumption, okay? And why would you assume that? My eyes burn and my throat aches at the thought. Harden and his brilliant. Assumptions. I don't know, maybe because that guy who showed up to pick him up looked like your everyday meth addict. He looks up at me with softness in his eyes. Did you see the guy's arms? I remember the man scratching his forearms, but he was wearing long sleeves. My father is not a drug addict I say slowly, unsure if I believe the words that are coming out of my mouth, but knowing that I'm not ready to face the possibility. You don't even know him. I wasn't even going to say anything. He steps toward me again, but I back away. My bottom lip trembles, and I can't look at him any longer. You don't know him either. And if you weren't going to say anything, then why did you? He shrugs. I don't know. My headache has now intensified, and I'm so exhausted that I feel like I could pass out at any moment. What was the point of saying it, then? I said it, because it just came out, and he broke into our fucking apartment. You don't know that. He wouldn't. Would he? Fine, Tessa, you go ahead, and pretend that your dad, who, may I remind you, is a drunk, is perfectly innocent here. His nerve is outstanding, as always. He is calling my father out for drinking? Hardin Scott is calling someone out for their drinking, when he gets so drunk that he can barely remember anything the next day? You're drunk too. I say and then instantly cover my mouth. What did you say? Any trace of sympathy drops from his face. He eyes me like a predator, starts circling me. I feel bad, but I can see he's just trying to scare me into staying quiet. He's so unaware of himself and how he is. If you think about it, you are. Do you only drink when you're upset or angry? Do you don't know when to stop drinking? And you're a mean drunk. Do you break things and get into fights? I'm not a fucking drunk. I had stopped drinking altogether until you came along. You can't blame me for everything, Hardin. I ignore the way my mind is reminding me that I too have been turning to wine when I'm upset or angry. I'm not blaming you for the drinking, Tessa, he says pretty loudly. Two more days and neither of us will have to worry about any of this. I stalk out into the living room, and he follows. Would you just stop and listen to me, he says in a tone that's electric, but at least it's not yelling. You know I don't want you to leave me. Yeah, well, you do a pretty good job at showing me otherwise. What is that supposed to mean? I tell you how much I love you on a constant. I see the flicker of doubt cross his face as he shouts the words to me. He knows that he doesn't show his love for me enough. You don't even believe that yourself. I can tell. Tell me this, then, you think you can find someone else to put up with your shit? Your constant whining and bitching, your annoying need to have everything in order, and your attitude? He waves his hands in the air in front of him. I laugh. I laugh right in Hardin's face. Even with my hand covering my mouth, I can't stop. My attitude? My attitude? You are constantly disrespecting me, you're borderline emotionally abusive, obsessive, suffocating, and rude. You came into my life, turned it upside down, and you expect me to bow down to you, because you have this idea of yourself that is complete bullshit. You act like you're this tough guy who doesn't give a crap about anyone but himself, yet you can't even sleep without me. I look past every single one of your flaws, but I will not stand around and let you talk to me like that. I pace back and forth across the concrete floor, and he watches my every move. I feel slightly guilty for yelling at him this way, but all it takes is remembering the words he just said to me to refuel my anger toward him. And by the way, I may be a lot to handle sometimes, but that's because I'm so busy worrying about you and everyone else around me and trying not to piss you off that I forget about myself. So excuse me if I annoy you or bitch at you when you're constantly lashing out at me for no damn reason. Hardin's expression is grave. His hands are in fists at his sides, and his cheeks are a deep red. I don't know what else to do, okay? Do you know that I haven't ever done this before, you knew going into this that I'd be a challenge. You have no right to bitch about it now. No right to bitch about it? This is my life too, and I can bitch about it if I fucking want to, 
I say with a snort. He can't be serious. For a second, I thought the expression on his face meant he'd apologize for the way he treats me, but I should have known better. The problem with Hardin is that when he's good, he's so good, so sweet and honest, that I love him so. But when he's bad, he's the most hateful person I have ever, and will ever, encounter. I walk back into the bedroom and open the suitcase, tossing my clothes into a pile inside of it. Where are you going? He asks me. I don't know, I answer truthfully. Away from you, I know that. Do you know what your problem is, Teresa? Your problem is that you read too many damn novels and you forget that they're all bullshit. There are no Darcy's, there are only Wickham's and Alec D'Urberville's, so wake up and stop expecting me to be some goddamn literary hero because it's not going to fucking happen. His words wrap around me and seep into my every pore. This is it. This is exactly why we will never work. I have tried and tried with you until I'm blue in the face. I have forgiven you for the disgusting things you have done to me and to others, yet you still do this to me. Actually, I do this to myself. I'm not a victim. I'm just a stupid girl who loves you too much, yet still I mean nothing to you. Once I leave on Monday, your life will go back to normal. You'll still be the same Hardin who doesn't give a shit about anyone, and I will be the one who is in pain and can barely function, but I did that to myself. I let myself get wrapped up in you, wrapped around your finger, knowing that it would end this way. I thought that when we were separated before, you'd see that you're better off with me than alone, but that's the thing, Hardin. You weren't better off with me. You're better off alone. You'll always be alone. Even if you find another naive girl who's willing to give everything up for you, including herself, she too will grow tired of the back and forth and leave you just the way I Hardin stares at me. His eyes are bloodshot, his hands are shaking, and I know he's about to lose it. Go on, Tessa. Tell me that you're leaving me. Better yet, don't. Just pack your shit and get out. Stop trying to hold yourself together, I tell him, angry, but also pleading inside. You're trying not to break, but you know you want to. If you just let yourself show me how you really feel, you know nothing of how I really feel. Leave. His voice catches at the end, and I want nothing more than to wrap my arms around him and tell him I would never leave him. But I can't. All you have to do is tell me. Please, Hardin, just tell me that you'll try, really try this time. I'm begging him. I don't know what else to do. I don't want to leave him, even though I know I have to. He stands there, only a few feet away from me, and I can see him shutting down. Every glimmer of light that my heart and holds is disappearing slowly, burning out into darkness, and taking the man I love further and further away from me. When he finally tears his eyes away from me and crosses his arms in front of his chest, I can see the way that he's gone now. I've lost him. I don't want to try anymore. I am who I am, and if that's not good enough, then you know where the door is. That's what you want, then? You're not even willing to try? If I leave, this time it'll be for good. I know you don't believe me, because I always say it, but it's true. Just tell me you're only acting this way, because you're panicking over me going to Seattle. Staring at the wall behind me, he simply says, I'm sure you can find somewhere to stay until Monday. When I don't respond, he turns on his heel and leaves the room. I stand in place, shocked that he hasn't came back to put up more of a fight. Minutes pass before I finally pick up the pieces of me that he has shattered and pack my bags for the last time. Chapter 53 Harden. My mouth keeps saying shit that my mind doesn't want it to say, but it's like I have absolutely no control over it. Obviously I don't want her to leave. I want to pull her into my arms and kiss her hair. I want to tell her that I'll do anything for her, that I'll change for her and love her until I die. Instead, I walk out and leave her standing alone. I hear her rustling around the bedroom. I know I should go in there and stop her from packing, but what's the point, really? She's leaving Monday, anyway, she may as well leave now. I'm still astounded that she brought up trying a long-distance relationship. It would never work, her being hours away from me, only calling once or twice a day, not sleeping in the same bed. I couldn't do it. At least if our relationship is terminated, I won't feel guilty for drinking 
and doing whatever the hell I choose to do, but who am I kidding, it's not even that I want to do anything else. I'd rather sit on the couch and have her force me to watch friends over and over than spend one minute doing something without her. Moments later, Tessa appears in the hallway dragging two suitcases behind her. Her purse is slung over her shoulder and her face is pale. I don't think I forgot anything except some books, but I'll just get new copies, she says in a low, shaky voice. This is it, this is the moment I feared since the day I met this girl. She's leaving me, and here I am, doing nothing to stop her. I can't stop her. She was always meant to do things greater than me, be with someone better than me. I knew that from the start. I was just hoping that somehow I would be wrong, as always. Instead of all that, I simply say, okay. Okay. She gulps and squares her shoulders. When she reaches the door, she raises her arm to grab her keys from the hook, and her purse slides down her shoulder. I don't know what's wrong with me. I should stop her, or help her, but I can't. Tessa looks back at me. Well, that's it, then. All the fighting, the crying, the lovemaking, the laughs, everything, it was all for nothing, she says softly. No anger tints her words. Just a blank blank neutrality. I nod, unable to speak. If I could speak, I would make this 100 times harder on both of us. I know it. She shakes her head and opens the door, holding it open with her foot, so she can drag the suitcases behind her. Once she's through the door, she looks over at me and says so quietly that it's barely audible, I will always love you. I hope you know that. Stop talking, Tessa. Please. And someone else will, too, hopefully as much as I do. SHH, I gently coax. I can't listen to this. You won't always be alone. I know I said that, but if you just get some help or something, learn to control your anger, you could find some I swallow the bile rising in my throat and step to the doorway. Go, just go I say, and shove the door in her face. Even through its thick wood, I can hear her sharp intake of breath. I just slam the door in her face, what the fuck is wrong with me? I begin to panic and let the pain course through me. I held it for so long, barely controlled, until she walked away. My fingers go to my hair, my knees hit the concrete floor, and I simply don't know what to do with myself. I'm officially the world's largest fuck up and there's nothing I can do about it. It sounds so simple, just go to Seattle with her and live happily ever after but it's not that damn simple. Everything will be different there, she'll be absorbed in her internship and new classes, she'll make new friends, experience new things, better things, and forget about me. She won't need me anymore. I wipe at the tears pooling in my eyes. What? For the first time I realize just how selfish I am. Make new friends? What's so bad about her making new friends and experiencing new things? I would be there, right next to her, experiencing them too. Why did I go to such lengths to keep her from Seattle instead of embracing this opportunity for her? This opportunity to prove that I could be part of something she wanted. That's all she asked of me, and I couldn't fucking deliver. If I call her right now, she'll turn the car around, and I can pack my shit and find us somewhere, anywhere, to live in Seattle. No, she won't, she won't turn around. She gave me the chance to stop her, and I didn't even try. She even tried to make me feel better while I was watching every ounce of fate she had in me die right in front of my eyes. I should have been comforting her, but instead I slammed the door in her face. You won't always be alone, she said. She's wrong. I will be, but she won't. She'll find someone to love her the way that I couldn't. No one will ever love that girl more than me, but perhaps they can show her how it feels to be loved. How it feels to have someone love you despite all the shit you put them through, the way she was always there for me, always. And she deserves to have that. Thinking about the fact that getting what she deserves means being with someone else makes it hard for me to breathe. But this is the way it should be. I should have let her go a long time ago instead of sinking my claws further into her and making her waste her time on me. I'm divided. Half of me knows she'll come back to me tonight, maybe tomorrow and forgive me. But the other half of me knows she really is done trying to fix me. Sometime later, I pull myself up from the floor and pad into the bedroom. When I get there, I nearly collapse again. 
The bracelet I had made for her sits on top of a piece of paper, alongside her e-reader and a copy of Wuthering Heights. I pick up the bracelet, twirl the infinity heart charm between my fingers, and look at the matching tattoo on my wrist. Why would she leave this here? It was a gift from me to her, at a time when I was desperate to show my love for her. I needed her love and forgiveness, and she gave it to me. To my horror, the piece of paper under the bracelet is the handwritten letter that I wrote her. As I unfold it and read it over, my chest is slowly ripped open, and its contents are tossed onto the hard floor. Memories flood my fucked up mind. The first time I told her that I loved her, then took it back, the date with the blonde girl that I tried to replace her with, the way I felt when I saw her standing in the doorway after reading the letter. I continue reading. You love me when you shouldn't, and I need you. I have always needed you and always will. When you left me just last week it nearly killed me, I was lost. So completely lost without you. I went on a date with someone last week. I wasn't going to tell you, but I can't stand to chance losing you again. My fingers tremble, and I nearly tear the flimsy paper trying to hold it still enough to read. I knew you can do better than me. I'm not romantic, I won't ever write you poetry, or sing you a song. I'm not even kind. I can't promise that I won't hurt you again, but I can swear that I will love you until the day that I die. I'm a terrible person, and I don't deserve you, but I hope that you'll allow me the chance to restore your faith in me. I am sorry for all the pain I have caused you, and I understand if you can't forgive me. She did forgive me, though. She's always forgiven me for my wrongs, but not this time. I was supposed to be restoring her faith in me, yet I continued to hurt her over and over again. My hands work quickly, tearing the pathetic confession into pieces. Falling, they swirl around before settling into a scattered pattern on the cold concrete. See, I destroy everything. I know how much that damn thing meant to her, and I turned it into a pile of shit. No, 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 no. I scurry to the ground and frantically try to gather the pieces and restore the page. But there are too many little bits, none of them line up, and I keep dropping them back onto the floor and watching them float here and there. This must be how she felt trying to put me back together. I stand and kick my boot at the pile of scraps I've gathered before quickly bending down and picking them up again and putting them in a pile on the desk. Covering them with a book so they can't blow away, I see I've grabbed Pride and Prejudice, a fucking course. I lie back on the bed and wait for the sound of the door clicking open, signaling her return. I must wait there for hours and hours, but the click never comes.